Pull our mics in, everybody. Pull our mics in. Isaac, your mic. I call this meeting of the Lakota Board of Education, a regular board meeting, Monday, May 9th, to order. Thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight. We are going to call the roll first, Mrs. Loken. Mr. Adi. Yes. Mrs. Bodie. Here. Mrs. Casper. Here. Mrs. Schaefer. Here. Mrs. O'Connor. Here. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and stand as you're able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Schaefer. Mrs. Bodie. Discussion? Mrs. Logan, the roll call, please. Mrs. Schaefer? Yes. Mrs. Bodie? Yes. Mr. Eddy? Yes. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. Board, we're going to move right to our student spotlight since we have a full house tonight. Sign and President. I would like to um, make a 30 second statement, if you don't mind. Could we put that on new business? If that would be more convenient. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Let's move to our student spotlight and we'll return to the front of our agenda after that. Hopefully you were able to take a moment to view examples of their artwork before the meeting downstairs. Between East and West high schools, we have 17 students who have been recognized at the state or national level, and sometimes both. We have 12 Ohio Governor's Youth Art Competition <clears throat> State winners, one Congressional Art Competition winner, six Scholastic Art and Writing National Silver and Gold Medal winners, and three students who have won the Amplifier and Getty Unshuttered National Competition. Congratulations to you, Chelsea F. Dazi, uh, Gwen Barnholtz, Zane Shreve, Alyssa Cleland, Ashley Fryer, Holly Garber, Samantha George, Chris Hardiman, Max Hartman, Heian Zhang, Gina Lin, Charlotte Moore, Ashton Nicholas, Brianna Rosado, Caitlin Tuttle, Jasmine Walker, and Alexander Wilson. Will you please welcome our very talented artists to share some thoughts with you? Superintendent Matt Miller, Treasurer and Lakota School Board. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be recognized this evening. My name is Alyssa Cleland and I'm a sophomore at Lakota East High School. I have recently received academic high honors for this school year. I play basketball and lacrosse for Lakota East. I enjoy jet skiing and kayaking at my aunt and uncle's home on Lake Michigan. I am a part of the Lakota East HOSA team, the Health Occup Occupation Students of America, who competes in different medical-based competitions. This past year, I competed in a forensic science event. I am a part of the Lakota East Relay for Life Club who fundraises for finding the cure for cancer. This summer, I plan on staying busy with my travel lacrosse team and working my first job. I'm excited to share with you my medals project I worked very hard on this year. My artwork is currently in Columbus at the Ohio Governor's Youth Art Exhibition because it won at the state level. One of my favorite things to do with my family is go hiking in the mountains of Arizona. This is what inspired me to create my piece. I love the feeling of getting to the top of it and feeling the warm sunshine and looking at an incredible view. I wanted a piece that reminded me of the wonderful memories I have hiking there. One of the challenges in this piece was the unknown of how the piece would turn out. To make the sketch designs of the trees, you have to put the piece in an acid called ferric chloride 
Using the asset, you don't know how much is going to be eaten away. And if the asset eats too much, your project can be ruined. I learned in this project that it's okay to make risks because you never know the amazing outcomes taking a risk can have. I want to thank my medals teacher, Mr. Dornan, for encouraging us to be creative in our art pieces. I truly have enjoyed branching out and taking his class this year. Lastly, thank you to my mom and dad for supporting me in everything I do and always being there for me. I am very proud to be a Lakota East Thunderhawk. Could you bring the mic in just a little bit, please? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Okay, I'm Gwen Barnholtz, and I'm uh, from Lakota West High School. And um, sorry if I'm a little tired. I just took the AP Calc test today. <laughs> I'm so tired. I have AP Physics coming up. I'm going through it. So sorry about that. But I'm not here for that. <laughs> I'm here because um, I'm celebrating some of the artwork that I've done, which you might have seen downstairs. So I was the first place winner for the Congressional Art Competition. Uh, so that's going to be okay. <laughs> So that's really cool because it gets, I'm pretty sure it goes in the U.S. Capitol building, which is going to be, that's cool. And I have not processed that yet, but very nice. <laughs> um, so I'm also the, uh, one of the winners for the Ohio Governor Show, as well as I got a gold and silver medal in the uh, plastic art and writing competition alongside the One Earth Scholarship, which is an $1,000 scholarship gifted to four students with work regarding climate change. That's cool as well. <laughs> so. Um, that's just some of the stuff that I did. I did come up wanting to talk about some of the art pieces that I did and why I won them. And I was super extra and I printed some of them out because that's the kind of person I am. So, uh, one of the pieces I did was, was honor and celebrate my grandma because we would bake apple pies together and she recently passed this year. And so I'm the one who bakes apple pies now. <laughs> so, um, in my painting, I want to display her like elements of her, like her cookbook, her apple peeler and the granny Smith apples she would bake. And so you can see that downstairs. So that's the one that's going to be in the congressional. That's very sweet. Um, and then the one that I won the um, thousand dollar scholarship for the um, climate change award was called the billionaire space race, which was done for our political cartoon um, project in our art class, which is so well done. So I really got to thank um, my teachers for that. Um, I'd really like to, to specifically thank my art teacher, Mrs. Kessler, because she's had a lot of faith in me and um, she's had so much support for me kind of just doing my own thing in the class and applying myself in different ways. So I'm really hopeful for my future at Ohio State uh, next year because I'm a senior and I'm really excited just to see where life takes me after high school and the college and Lakota's prepared me well for that. So I got to thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Samantha. I'm a student from Lakota West, um, and I uh, won a couple of awards for my art pieces at Lakota West. Uh, some of them include um, the uh, picture I have in the Gettys Museum that's going to be featured there. Um, I also won a Scholastic Gold Medal for um, my political cartoon, and um, also like a yeah, I think, I, yeah, I can't even remember some of them. There's been so many <laughs> because um, I, I've never done competitions like this before. Lakota West and our, my art teachers, Ms. Kessler and Ms. Gower have been exposing us to so many competitions that I've never even heard of. So I've got to thank them for that. Um, some of my inspirations in my piece is got to be like my personal life and um, some of the aspects of it. So things like my culture in one of my pieces, my self portrait I did, I have aspects from my culture um, as an Indian. So um, I'm holding a mirror and I, maybe you've got to see it downstairs. I put it up there. I'm holding a mirror that's from my state in India that's only crafted there and wearing Indian clothes. I thought demonstrating my culture in that piece is like very personal to me. I also, um, for my scholastic cartoon, I won a, um, I mean, I have it about immigration, which is I'm an immigrant to this country. And um, it was really about the situation faced by immigrants crossing the southern border of the United States, which was you know, personal to me, but also I think was a big issue then. So I like putting that personal touch into my pieces because I want it to communicate like more than a mess, more than just beauty, but also like a message as well. Um, I, yeah, I've, as I said again, like I have to thank Ms. Kessler and Ms. Gower for um, giving me the opportunity to be here and all of the competitions they've exposed us to, because I honestly, I wouldn't have known of them without them. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.
you. Hello, my name is Chelsea Fazy, and I'm a student from Lakota West. Um, I would like to thank you guys for inviting us to be here and be able to share our accomplishments with you. Um, it's really exciting for me. This whole year has been very exciting in what I've done in art. I want to first thank my teachers, my art teachers, um, Mrs. Kessler and Mrs. Gower, Mrs. Gower for really immersing me into what my art could be. And then Mrs. Kessler for branching off of that, teaching me things and letting me be able to shine through my artwork. I've always loved doing art and it's it's really exciting that to win all these awards and just to be exposed to the possibilities. Um, I, will, I won a gold key for my oil pastel painting that's downstairs. It's a self-portrait. Um, it's called Reaching for Richard Shake. Reaching for Richer Shades. Um, and it's really just a documentation of my culture and the things that make me me um, before everything where my roots are. I really wanted to showcase that part of me and showcase that in beauty with the colors and the sun um, and just the bright colors of everything signifying how beautiful culture could be. So I'm really excited about my artwork and where I could go from here, whether that's maybe possibly minoring in art or putting together all my art, all my art pieces for an exhibition. I'm just really excited about the future. I'm going to Ohio State, so I know there's a lot of possibilities over there. Again, I would like to thank you guys for being able to bring this opportunity to us so that we could showcase who we are through our artwork. And I would like to thank my teachers and my parents too for making all of this possible. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brianna Rosado. And unlike everyone else, I have nothing prepared. So <laughs> let's get to talk away. Um, so my photo won the Congressional Art Competition, so it's the grand prize winner, and I will be flying to Washington, D.C. to go see them display it in their little tunnel that they have, so that's pretty cool. Um, unlike all the other artists here, I wasn't really into photography before I came to main campus. I just took it because I needed the art credit. Um, <laughs> but uh, the teachers at Lakota West are just really good at um, really embracing the talent that the students have. I had little talent and Mrs. Kessler was really good about um, growing what I did have. And so now this specific <clears throat> photo has won many, many awards and I'm so thankful for that and my parents and everyone here. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ashley Fryer, and I go to Lakota West. Um, tonight I'm being recognized for winning a gold medal at this Glastic National Art Competition. But along with that, I won the American Visions Award, which from each region, five art pieces are nominated for that. And then around 50 get selected in the entire country. So I'm very lucky to have won that. I also won three state awards in the Ohio Governor's Youth Art Competition, um, one being in the top 25, so I'm very lucky for that. Um, I started AP drawing this year, and it wasn't originally in my plan of what I was gonna do. I was gonna just do ceramics class instead of going into uh, AP drawing, but Mrs. Kessler convinced me to drop ceramics and <laughs> take drawing and painting for the next uh, semester. And very glad she did because I've learned a lot about what I can do in drawing and painting and experimenting. And my um, sustained investigation is what it's called for my AP drawing portfolio is about the struggles of what it takes to get to success in athletics. I'm a swimmer. So it just goes through basically my season and all of the like mental and physical struggles that I endure to reach the top success that I eventually achieve. And 
I hope I do well on the exam. <laughs> um, so the pieces that I've won aren't here right now because they've either been sent for the exam or they're on display places. But I just want to thank Ms. Gower and Ms. Kessler for supporting all of us and being very considerate of when we have conflictions and everything. But I will be going to Bowling Green State University in the fall and studying graphic design. And I'm also committed to swim for them. So oh, nice. it'll be exciting to see what I can do. Hi, I'm Jasmine Walker. I'm a senior at Lakota West. Um, thank you for having us. I know some other people already said that, but thank you for <laughs> giving us the opportunity to come here and speak in front of you about our art, which we're so passionate about. Um, I am being recognized for a state winner in the Governor Show, which is a piece from my state investigation. Ashley covered on it a little. It's, it's our focus in our AP art class. Um, my sustained investigation was on, it was a discovery into self-portraits and my personal identity with social pressures and struggles. So all my pieces, almost all my pieces are self-portraits. I've gotten pretty used to looking at my face. <laughs> um, uh, the piece that actually um, won was kind of one of my more difficult ones this year because it was a new media that I hadn't used before and I had to, it was gouache paint. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar and it lifts once you paint over it again. But in that piece, I had to do a reflection. So that took me, you can ask Ms. Gower, it was really stressful and took a little bit of work. But one thing I've learned in these classes is to power through and to really, that the end product is really worth all the struggle along the way. Um, I think I've won about over, I've won over 16 awards in the past few years over art. And I really, I can really thank Ms. Kessler and Ms. Gower for that. Um, I'm currently, like Ashley just said, I'm in AP art. And it, it, was, it was an experience at first on the first day of school when Ms. Gower told us we'd be creating a project a week and quite stressful to be honest, but um, I'm really thankful I took that class because without it, I wouldn't, have the, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I'm a senior this year, so I'm graduating and I'll be going to Florida, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University in Tallahassee. So I'm really looking, and I'll be studying architecture, so my art portfolio is complete. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you here for having us and Ms. Gower and Ms. Kessler for. <laughs> so just so you guys know, we're not letting you off too easy. Would you all come back over to the microphone for us? We might have a few questions or comments to make. So if you'll give us just a moment for everybody to come back up. Um, I'm going to kick our comments off. We are so proud of all of you and love to see this kind of student achievement. And I love that I think every single one of you recognized your teachers and what they did to help you find your passion. And I really appreciate that you understand the value of that. Thank you for that. And Gwyneth, you are actually in the Capitol Tunnel with yours. If there's a tunnel that goes that connects buildings in, in the um, state house in Washington. And you'll be one of 50 states. You'll be representing our state, which is absolutely wonderful. So I'll look forward to seeing those and all the rest of you walking through the hallway. It was, it was amazing. So thank you for the great work you did. That was a lot of hard work you took to get here and to be recognized. Board? Wow. Um, I, I'm like Mrs. O'Connor, very impressed. And the way you speak about your passion and your art is amazing to me because I still draw stick people. So I'm always very impressed with any kind of artist up there. So congratulations. We are so, so very proud of you. And Ashley, weren't you hanging in the Capitol? Yeah, I was she, she won last year and didn't get to celebrate because of COVID. So you finally got to go? Okay. Yeah, because you didn't get to go last year because of COVID, so. We're glad you got a do-over, that's terrific. Yep. <laughs> um, I loved all of the comments about your teachers opening up the possibilities and almost believing in you beyond what you believed in yourself. And so that's amazing that they were able to draw that talent out. Um, and again, I am I am in awe also of, of the talent my sister, um, 
taught for a short time as an art teacher, and uh, it was always, it always amazes me how people can manage to pull that talent out of students and the and the talent that you have to be pulled, because no teacher could get it out of me, I assure you. <laughs> um, so congratulations on all of that. And I'm just curious if any of you, your pieces that were picked as winners, if they were your favorites or you actually have other art that you like better that was not what actually won the contest. Anybody, I don't know. Yeah, there's somebody who it looks like wants to speak to that. My entire art class has hold me, heard me say on multiple occasions that I've despised every single piece that has won an award <laughs> because the ones I always think are the best and that are always my favorites don't seem to get picked. So I, this piece, the one that won in the Governor's State show, I do like it, but it's I, I picked it because I knew I wouldn't have it for the AP exam and I, it wasn't one of my favorites, so I put it in. <laughs> um. I'm kind of like Jasmine for a lot of the pieces. Um, I want to make sure I have it for the AP exam. So I don't like select my favorite ones to put into competitions <laughs> and I like don't expect anything out of them, but for scholastic, the piece that I won with was actually, is actually my favorite art piece that I've done. I asked my swim coach for a bunch of old swim practices and I glued them down on a piece of canvas board and um, did a watercolor self-portrait over top of all the practices. And it was the third piece that we had ever done. And that's like the only piece that I've been excited about doing the no. entire time. It's like, I'm like, man, I did that one for number three and now I've got 13 more to go. So, but yeah, that is one of my favorite ones. That's awesome. This is Bodhi, Mr. Adi. Oh, it's like, it's, oh, did sorry, Samantha yeah. wanted to yeah. say something? So, I mean, I think one of my favorite pieces that one was um, my piece, The American Dream. So I, some of them, some of my pieces, I'm not too enthused about when they win and some of them I, I really do like. Um, that one was a pointillism project. So it consisted mm -hmm. of tiny dots on a canvas for about, I mean, on a uh, drawing board. And we had to do that for like weeks. And I thought my arm was going to fall off. And I think all of us in our class were like done with it, but it turned out really good. And it, I think it conveyed a message that I really liked. And it was, yeah, it was one of my favorite pieces. So, yeah. All right, I just wanted to say congratulations on the recognition and the awards that you guys received regarding your artistic skill. Um, like, you too, I can really make a house with a square and a triangle roof, like that's the best I can do. Um, so um, it definitely takes time and energy to hone your skill. And I wanted to know how many hours has, does it take to get to your, uh, your winning pieces? We, so for our AP drawing class, we have a week and a half to, uh, finish a project. So every week we have one and a half projects due. We have a final project and an in-progress project. And we went around the class and asked everyone how long we think it takes each of us. And it's about 20 plus hours it takes for each project we do. And we have, we've done like 25 projects. Wow. Yeah. Along with what Ashley said, it may seem like it's a lot of time, but when you sit down in like your art space and just crank out a piece for like six hours straight and get it done in like two, three days, you're like happy that it's done so quickly. So it's really, it's not as bad as it seems. Like there are sometimes we don't get it done and sometimes where it's harder, but it's not that bad. <laughs> Unlike everyone else, it takes me about five minutes to do my work because oh. I take pictures. <laughs> I love that last comment. Mr. Okay, um, <laughs> Mr. Adi, take it away. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'm very excited to see uh, you all come out to share uh, your talents. Uh, you are thanking us, but I think we should be the one thanking you because we're here for you. And the spotlight should be on you, not us. So thank you for what you do. And as I listen to you, um, I had parents, parents support, I had 
culture, immigration, teachers, staff, and then best of all, personal identity. Be yourself and be your best. We are here to support you. And I would like, I, for me, instead of the news should be on us, it should be on you. And that is why we're here. Thank you so much. Wise, wise words, Mr. Adi, Mrs. Logan. I just congrats. And I am always amazed, just like so many people have said, I do not believe I have an artistic bone in my body. Um, but I have daughters who uh, were very passionate and I was always amazed at how much time it took. They didn't take pictures, <laughs> um, but the time and the intensity, um, I, I am just in awe of all of you, as well as everything else that you're doing. Like, yeah, this is one piece of you and you have mastered it and you have excelled, but there's so much more that makes you richer students, richer beings. So thank you for sharing your talents with us. We appreciate it. Take us home, Mr. Miller. Just uh, thank you for maximizing your opportunities. You talked about that. You talked about Mrs. Gower. You talked about uh, Mrs. Kessler and your parents and their influence. Um, congratulations. And I think the young lady that has an AP test, does she sneak out or she's still here? Oh, there you are. Good <laughs> luck. Good luck on that. Um, I can see the AP glaze a little bit, um, but we wish you, we wish you luck on that. The other thing too, I just um, um, appreciate you being here, getting recognized, but also um, I'll give a, a shout out to Representative Warren Davidson. I was in DC a few months ago and um, I was in his office and I saw a lot of artwork there. So I started looking um, to see where the artwork came from. And every piece that I saw was Lakota East or Lakota West. Now he represents, oh, yeah. I was, I was going to give him grief if I saw another one of his district schools represented, but I didn't. Um, and it was it was all, all Lakota. So um, great work. And um, thank you. Thank you for being here. And thanks to the parents for bringing them tonight as well. One more round of applause for our students, please. <laughs> students, if you would please come toward the middle here and we're going to get a picture with you. Are there teachers here? Mrs. Kessler and Mrs. Gower. Mrs. Gower's here. Would you stand up? Can we give you a round of applause as well? Yeah. And Mrs. Fuller, I think we have one more student and staff spotlight. All right. on his ACT. More than 1.7 million students take the college entrance exam each year and only 0.33% earn a perfect score. So I believe he was being inducted into the National Honor Society tonight. Let's give him a round of applause. So. So on to our next spotlights. Um, we want to provide learning opportunities for our students that help them prepare um, for success when they walk across our graduation stage. This is just one example of how we are personalized and we are future ready. The launch of the Lakota Cyber Academy three years ago is a perfect example of this. Right now, there are 1 million job openings in cybersecurity, and this number is expected to increase to 3.5 million in just three years. We know that the students at both East and West high schools are interested in pursuing a career in cyber. So as the program continues to grow, so do our success stories. Lakota East senior, Zoe Chapel, is here to share more about this program. 
Zoe has earned her CompTIA Security Plus certification through the Lakota Cyber Academy. The certification is a recognized credential throughout the world and validates that the holder is proficient in a wide range of cybersecurity topics, including attacks, vulnerabilities, risk management, and more. And this is a certification that adults get, but our kids do too. Mm -hmm. Zoe interned during her senior year for Standex Electronics working in cybersecurity. She's the co-founder of only the third high school chapter nationally of Women in Cybersecurity and is involved with Lakota LOCKS, which stands for Ladies of Cybersecurity, a Lakota-specific program to encourage young women to excel in cyber and IT. Additionally, Zoe has traveled to our junior schools this year to talk to students about cybersecurity and the opportunities that await them if they choose to enroll in our cyber academy. She'll be interning at um, Fifth Thirds Bank this summer in their cybersecurity department and is in negotiations with another company for a job in cybersecurity next fall while she attends the Rochester Institute of Technology. Come on up, Zoe. That was a very good introduction. I promise <laughs> I'm not that scary. <laughs> My name is Zoe. I'm a senior. I go to Lakota East. I'm in Cyber 3, and I'm part of the first crew to go through the cyber program. This is, it's brand new. I, I've kind of been a guinea pig for a lot of things. Uh, I'll just go into more detail. The reason I'm here is I got my CompTIA certification, which makes me hireable right now. The other company she mentioned was US Bank. We had a field trip over there a couple, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and they were really interested in us. And I've been talking to them and they were very impressed and they are willing to hire me like right now. This is a real thing. <laughs> and the reason it's so impressive and why it's recognized is because of how much it covers. It's really like a mile wide and about a mile deep. <laughs> it's really crazy. And then on top of that, like she mentioned, I am the co-founder and vice president of a women in cybersecurity club that, well, chapter that combines both Lakota East and West. And what we do is what you can't do in a classroom. So we introduce our female students to other industry professionals to make connections, to learn, to open opportunities. We also take personal like recommendations. So we don't have a lot of hardware experience. So one of the things that I was able to do was with my internship, I got computers and I brought some old PCs in and we just ripped them to shreds because we never got the opportunity to do that. And it's really exciting that we're able to do that and that I'm able to give this kind of opportunity to other girls. Uh, as mentioned, I also went to the, all of the um, junior highs and freshman campuses to pitch cyber, essentially. It is really a growing field and our cyber program is great. <laughs> One of the things I always tell people is when I walked into cyber, I knew control C is copy and control V is paste. <laughs> and I knew nothing else, not a single thing. And now I have two internships lined up, a certification. I'm the leader of a club. It's really, truly great at preparing. And I wanted to bring that to other kids in Lakota. And so I went to all of them. I did my little presentation and they were all really, really eager, which was great. I was so excited about that. Uh, I've also been on the student board for the Lakota Cyber Academy for three years, which is also exciting as of my other things because I get to have a role in the way that cyber at Lakota East and West proceeds in the future. I get to give my feedback and they act on that. And it's great. <laughs> it's really great because I have just, it's amazing to see how much of a role that I can actually play in influencing where we go. And in the future, right now, I'm working on my Azure Fundamental Certification, which is cloud computing. And then I'm heading to Rochester Institute of Technology. I'll be majoring in cybersecurity, and I'm hoping to get my combined master's and bachelor's degree. Thank you. <laughs> Zoe. <laughs> Just in case you guys nice try. <laughs> Figured it off that easy, did you? I thought. I'm sure we have some questions. Mr. D, we'll start with you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I have a bachelor's degree and master's degree, but it took me more than 10 years to get it done. Mm -hmm. For you to say you're going to be going for both your bachelor's degree and master's degree. I salute you. <laughs> Thank you. Keep on going on because 
uh, student achievement is one of the greatest things that is in my heart. And I can see that happening and I appreciate that I am going to be part of your story as I'm sitting right here. Thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, I hope to get mine in five years. Maybe not 10. I don't think I have enough money for 10. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Well, Zoe, congratulations. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing you at the Cyber Academy night. Showcase they, event? On your I watch. I see, yes, I saw you there. But one of the things that I heard there, which I thought was so impressive, is that when you went to U.S. Bank, there were uh, co-op students from the University of Cincinnati who said that you all in Cyber Academy right now knew more than they did as juniors in college. Wow. So that speaks to the amazing program we have. Um, I know we've said before, but Mr. Miller and Mr. Coney for bringing this program to Lakota. And the fact that you are on the cyber student board also is what we love to say, student voice. We do expect our students to have a hand in their education and make a difference. So congratulations, we're so, so proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> Another piece in that showcase was the access to employers and other businesses that have partnered with us. So I know I was impressed with how many business partners we had at that event. Um, and you spoke about kind of opening up access to this field for others. How can we help support your efforts in that area? Honestly, I think just communication, start spreading the word, tell people we have a really cool academy and, a really, and really smart students, and then direct them to the students. You could talk to our teachers, you could talk, talk to Catherine Bauer, things like that. I just think general connecting and bringing people to the area, especially because Cincinnati is such a hub right now for cybersecurity and IT, I think it'll be fairly, fairly easy. I'll say easy as a word. Yeah, great, thank you. I'm, just, I'm really impressed with um, what you have accomplished so far, and um, I see you developing leadership skills, and I, and I like that you're finding a voice and that you're able to uh, participate in, um, in the program and what you, are, what you are suggesting is being implemented. I think, um, I think this is a field that is never going to go away. So I just, I see you climbing and being really successful uh, with the skills that you are developing from the cyber program. And um, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. This is Logan, Mr. Miller. <laughs> You're not finished. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to know um, how many more female students have you been able to recruit? <coughs> And are you seeing interest from some of the girls that you're talking to? Um, I can tell you that our Cyber 2 does not have a single female in the Cyber 2 class. However, our Cyber 1 does have, we have about four. Okay. Uh, three of them routinely show up. One of them has sports. So what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> and then over at West, I think they have a little bit more of a female population. They have about four to five students that come in. And I'm a little bit unfamiliar with the actual like ratio in those classes. So for perspective, like when you say four or five out of how many? How many students? 50. Are, okay. Got 40 it. to 50. Got it. Like I've been the only girl in all of my cyber classes, mm -hmm. except in cyber one, where half of them dropped out the first semester. So it is very, there's definitely a deficit in women with women. And well, you are an example yep. and hopefully um, some more girls are watching you and we'll, we'll take your lead. I hope so too. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Zoe, congratulations once again. Um, do you remember the conversation we had and a couple other students at when the League of Innovative Schools Digital Promise came? And I said, I think it was either to you or to another young lady that was in the program. She might have been at West. I said, what do you need or what do we need to do differently? Do you remember what the answer was? I'm not setting you up. I'm just asking. I honestly don't remember. We had a, we had a conversation about starting cyber as a freshman and not just sophomores. Oh, yeah. So that, that was one of the things we talked about in terms of and that might help too. Um, 
depending on what the master facilities plan comes about. So, um, and what does that look like? And to your point, when you started out, the things that you knew, and maybe we can do some more things on the hardware and the actual physical part of, of technology uh, the freshman year. So I got feedback from you and I, there was a young lady, I think she was only a junior maybe. Um, from West. Day. Yep, yep. So um, I remember that conversation vividly and took it back to the curriculum team and had that conversation. The other thing I'd ask you to do, you talked a little bit about um, the industry partners. Is there a shout out that you can give to any of the industry partners or to any mentors or Sherpas that you had? Uh, my Sherpa was Pete Renniker. He works at Deloitte. I love Pete. <laughs> Pete is one of those guys. I can, I have him on LinkedIn and I'll just send him a text. I'll be like, hey, Pete, I have this problem. What would you do with it? And he, and he immediately, almost immediately sets up a phone call with me, which is great because I know he's a very busy man. And then I want to thank Standex, Standex Electronics. They gave me my internship. I've been working with them since November. And the coolest part about that is I actually am doing stuff in the company. I'm not like copying papers and bringing coffee. I am actively addressing vulnerabilities. I have about 2,000 computers worldwide that I actively address vulnerabilities on. And my main project is encryption, which I do that remotely as well. I'm working on encryption in Portugal, Germany, uh, Canada. There's a couple other states I'm doing it in. I'm working really closely with the UK right now. It's amazing the experience I've gotten. You went over my head about two minutes ago. Congratulations. <laughs> So we re let me wrap it up just by saying, keep leading the way. We're so proud of you. You're doing a terrific job and we look forward to seeing what you're going to do in the future. Thank you. Would you come over and join the board for a photo, please? Do you want to staff first? Okay. Hold on that one, Zoe. <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason why. So amazing student accomplish accomplishments like this would not be possible without dedicated teachers like Ben Doherty. And Mr. Doherty is actually at Lakota West, and he helped launch the Lakota Cyber Academy three years ago. He quickly, he's quickly becoming recognized as one of the most well-regarded cyber teachers in the country. This year, he was named to the National Cyber League Coaches Committee. He was also selected to be a part of the first cohort of educators for the National Cybersecurity Teaching Academy. The academy is 12 credit hours, six this summer and six next summer, and is fully funded by a scholarship from the National Centers of Ac Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity, which is located in the National Security Agency, the NSA. Um, ben was also asked to be a member of the K-12 cybersecurity education community of interest through the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education and the National Institute for Standards and Technology. He's recently been selected as one of four teachers in the United States to be recognized by cyber.org and the Cyber Innovation Center with their inaugural National Cyber Educator Award. Mr. Doherty will have the opportunity to present a master class about teaching at the organization's national conference in Washington, DC this summer. Come on up. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board and Mr. Miller and uh, Ms. Logan. Thank you so much for inviting me here this evening to talk about our cybersecurity program with you. Um, as uh, Ms. Fuller mentioned, we started this program three years ago and I was hired to come here and uh, work with Mr. McCain, who's here tonight as well, uh, to get this program up and running. And I certainly want to take a moment to thank him for all of his hard work and everything that he has done because he has been a real mentor to me and he's uh, retiring this year, as you probably already know. And um, certainly I'm gonna miss him as I continue to move this program forward with the curriculum department, um, but we will um, be handicapped without him there to help us. So um, I thank him for all that he has done in helping us establish this program. And, and Zoe is such a phenomenal spokesperson for what this program is and what it can be for students. Uh, we have, as, as she mentioned, uh, when we talk with our business partners here locally and, and around the country, what we hear from our business partners is keep doing what you're doing, keep pushing the students forward. We have a national shortage of cybersecurity defenders, and it is a, a matter of critical national importance, both uh, from the business side of things as well as from the national security side of things, that we, we fill that gap. 
And what we're creating here is a pipeline to get students directly into the position to start making a difference in both the business world as well as in the public sector right away. Um, many of our students are going on to college, but many of them are going to be doing internships and things and co-ops while they're doing their college so that they can begin contributing to helping make our national infrastructure and our business infrastructure safer really already before they've even graduated. So we're so proud of all that they do. And, uh, and we thank you for this opportunity. And we thank you for all that you've done to support the program. I, you know, this, is a, this program is obviously very outside the box. No one else, hardly anyone in the country is doing anything like this. Lakota is really um, leading the way and blazing the trail. Other, other areas of the country are looking at us, looking at our program as a model for, for what they can do in their local areas. And, um, and that's because all of you had the, the courage to say yes to a program that um, some people might have been afraid of or concerned about. And so uh, I, I certainly thank you for your support and, and I'm very excited to continue to grow this program. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. Um, Mr. Miller, would you like to speak for all of us? Just congratulations to you. And I'm so glad that you gave Dave a shout out too for retirement because it's a team effort. And, um, and thank you for all your work and the curriculum team. And you can see the fruits of your labor tonight and just one of your students. But um, both of you gentlemen have built this program. We have over 200 kids that are in it for next year. Um, we need more females, but, um, but we'll get there. So thank you for uh, just being a part of it and launching it. And congratulations on your award. I'm looking forward to celebrating you when you get to do that this summer. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. So this was an unusual meeting. We don't generally have um, 50 minutes of student recognition and staff recognition at the front of it. And I got a couple of texts that said, where's the board business? And so what I'd like to say is this is our board business. This is our core business, whether it's achievement in the classroom or it's achievement outside of the classroom. So let us give one more round of applause. Now we'll get down to this business. So as we begin, I know we have a full house tonight. There may be, even be some that have not attended before. So I would ask of you to please remember this is a formal business meeting. We welcome your attendance, whether you're in person or you're here via Zoom. It's imperative that the board and that our superintendent and treasurer are able to actively listen to all sides of a given issue so that we can make good decisions that support all of our students. We expect that all attendees here at the board table and those in the audience will behave appropriately in this setting. This, this includes speaking respectfully, refraining from clapping, cheering, unless of course it's in recognition of achievement of our staff or our students. Finally, we're well aware that there continues to be a great deal of public attention on the district. It's my continued position that we all should, should act according to the code of ethics within our bylaws and that all parties should always be respectful of each other. So we'll ask that you help us with that. And I thank you for your cooperation. And with that, Mr. Miller, superintendent comments. Thank you, thank you Mrs. O'Connor. Um, just yeah. briefly, I wanna address one of the things that have come up and that's uh, our calendar and election day. 
Um, in November, we always have that day off in terms of uh, our schools are used as a polling place. I know some people might have thought we were off all the time when we have elections, but generally speaking, during the spring primaries, our schools are open because it's usually low voter turnout. Depending on the building, um, some buildings don't have access to the main part of the school, but the way they're designed, sometimes they do. Um, but our SROs know what's going on and they're on high alert. So our administrators, but that's something that we can take a look at. I know Mr. Vogelman is going to talk about the calendar tonight. Uh, it's just a first read, but we can look at perhaps um, for our other primaries, not having school in session. So we might need to tweak the calendar again. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Sure. Anything else? No, that's it for right now. Okay. Mrs. Thanks. Logan? No, I don't have any comments at this time. Thank you. We move to number seven, board public comment. This will be our first opportunity for public comment. It needs to be an uh, issue on the agenda for tonight for this first session of the um, public comment. The intention is for the board to hear from our community. And we appreciate that people take the time to address us. I do want to stress that these public comment sections are not intended to be a back and forth. It's just meant to be a time when we can hear from you to not only run a more efficient meeting, but also to give our staff and our school leaders an opportunity to do their due diligence and researching questions. We won't respond to public comments at the end of the session. However, comments that do ask specific questions will be answered via email or phone. If you've signed in on here and you have a specific question, please make sure you include a phone number or an email so that we have a way to address you. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. When you see the yellow, it'll be up here on the timer. You'll see a countdown clock. That's your signal to conclude your comment and to be done by three minutes, please. And please be respectful of the time limit. We'd like to get as many people through as possible. As a final reminder, there should be no response from our audience during our public comments. We strongly encourage applause again if it's a student. Mrs. O'Connor. Yes. Can you also mention that if there is a question that pertains to all, there would be interest to everyone and Mr. Miller would address answering that for circling back to this. During the next board meeting. So Mr. Miller will, if it's a community-wide issue, address it at the next meeting. We also ask that you're a resident, a business owner, or the parent of a current uh, student if you're going to speak. All right, with that in mind, what I'm going to call do is call a name and I'd ask you to line up over here so that we move as quickly as possible. Mr. Hall will be up first. Mr. Benjamin McCall will be up second and Mr. Rusty Jesse will be third. Todd Hall, Todd Hall, 7791 Joan Drive, Westchester resident and business owner. Um, I'll save you three minutes. I just wanted to make sure my name was on the paper in case I did want to say anything and I don't yet. So I'll pass it to the next one. <laughs> That's the kind of public comment we like. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hall. I think that may be a record that you just earned, sir. <laughs> uh, good call. evening. I think it's great that we're recognizing students. Oh, Benjamin McCall, uh, Gray Birch Knoll. I think it's great that we're recognizing students. I think it's awesome that we spent so much time on students because that is the role of the board. That is the role of the district. Um, and in conjunction with that, there's a lot of things that need to go in place to be able to support it. And I'm a big supporter of uh, a lot of the discussions that have been happening around the financial plan. So, you know, the discussions around the Lakota master plan have started to back up the uh, what's on the agenda tonight, as well as what was discussed in the last administration meeting around the five-year forecast, those are all important. Uh, and they're gonna be incredibly important to address the technology, the spaces, to be able to include and to allow students to do these things. So with all that in mind, I just have a question in general to the administration and the board, knowing that the five-year forecast is important to address, knowing that the Lakota master plan is something that should be on everyone in the district's minds and focused on within these meetings, um, and that they're pivotal to the future of the district, I'd like to know as an administration, if you could address tonight during, during the meeting as it's an agenda item, do you as an administration and board believe you're on schedule with any of the timelines? Uh, and if to be able to focus on the five-year plan and also to focus on the master plan, and if you're not, what do you believe the board should do to ensure that these remain a focus and 
to minimize anything that takes away the focus from these things, because these are the things that are going to be important. And I know my son is going to feel like it's important. He's going to be going through East and it's going to be addressing it with the next few years in order to make the cyber uh, academy build up and grow to make the administration and all this curriculum be able to work. That has to be in place. All the other stuff is noise. So the five-year forecast and the master plan needs to be focused on. And if there's anything that's in the way, what are the things that you need to do in order to make sure you get back on track for that? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Mr. Jesse. Rusty Jesse. Um, today, when I was at work and looked at the agenda for the evening under personnel items, I noticed that Mr. Parsage is up for a five-year contract renewal. Uh, but there's no salary listed like it seems like every other employee does. So I'm curious as to how much he'll be making first year through the fifth year, including his raises. And part B of that is uh, I'm on the assumption that we are still being sued in federal court. And the research that I you know, looked on Pulse Journal, um, Mr. Parsage is the one that sent the emails to uh, the Butler County Sheriff's Department after a private citizen and his place of employment. And I really wonder if it's a good decision for the district as no one from the district has come forward and publicly to my knowledge said that they told him to do that, whether it's the board or whether it's administration, I don't think it's a good idea to give him a five-year extension until we know that this has worn, worked itself out. Now, one year, okay, but I don't think it's a good idea for five years. So, um, that was my statement, and that was my question. Is it a good idea to give an employee? And this is something that had to be brought up tonight because it's up for approval tonight. So I don't know that this is going to be pushed off for a couple of weeks. I think you guys have to discuss it later this afternoon, this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jesse. Uh, just as a summary, Mr. Hall, congratulations. <laughs> Get a prize for Mr. Mr. McCall Hall. is asking if we're on time. Given some of the important work that the board is engaged in, are we still on a timeline that's uh, going to work for the things that we need to get done? And Mr. Jesse had a particular personnel issue, which I don't believe we're going to discuss in public session. Mr. Miller, would you like to say anything about that? No, I have I, I, my only comment about that. And I'll, I'll save it for when we're going through staffing. Okay. When we go through that piece on my superintendent recommendations. Okay. All right. Thank you. We have no further. Um, Individuals signed up for our first public comment section. So we will move on to number eight, board updates. Mrs. Schaefer, Butler Tech. Uh, we just had the all boards meeting, which you all attended. Hopefully you had an opportunity to see the student showcases that were happening within the building, as well as partake in the dinner provided by the culinary arts students. That's always a um, a great opportunity for them to showcase their talent and what they've worked on. They were able to each serve. They, so the students at Butler Tech who are seniors plan a menu and provide lunch. Um, for There's a period of weeks where they serve lunch on Wednesdays and Thursdays. You can go and dine in their restaurant and they each picked their favorite item from their planned menus to serve um, at the all boards meeting. So everyone could sample that. So that was a great opportunity to see. Um, another highlight is um, it's in the newsletter. The local artists um, came in and helped the students paint murals and uh, highlighting the five different programs in the School of the Arts. And those are now being displayed in the hallway in the School of the Arts. And then again, what's showcasing more artistic talent. It's amazing. Um, one of the showcases the night of the board's meeting, as well as a presenter at our last board meeting, was a young lady who did as her capstone project, Magnified Giving. Um, it's a program where students do a presentation, they pick a particular charitable organization, they make a presentation, and then they are actually given money to donate to that organization. Only two of the 11 member districts in Butler Tech currently do that, plus Butler Tech, Lakota is one of them, and it's a great opportunity. Um, then the adult education, they are offering amazing programs to all of the adult of students or adult students who may need to be re-educated. And they had previously been running in the red. And so now they've turned that around and they've been able to run um, in the block for the last two years. So congratulations to adult ed. That's been a real focus of both the board and adult ed. And it's great to see so many people taking advantage of those programs. Um, 
One more thing in the meeting, if you haven't had a chance to see them, that we had, there was an art student who made a pair of sneakers that are, one is East and one is West. So we're hoping that Mr. Miller can get a hold of those at some point. I don't know if they'll, they'll let them go, but he put those in a, uh, in an email here, a Facebook post that he put, and I think they're just amazing. So they, they are the right size, <laughs> and they may show up at graduation. There you go. Just Perfect. so you know, we told them to lock them away because <laughs> we're coming around. Yeah, that's right. Right. So yes, yes, they did. What each they there was a student who did one for every every one of the member districts, so they all displayed them. So it was, it was fun. It was really cool because the sneakers had east and west, but each each shoe had representation of right. uh, things in Westchester for the west one, and, and it was really cool to see in uh, Liberty Center in the in the east one. So well well done. Yep. Kudos to those okay. kids. And graduation will be May 16th, and that is a ticketed event. So that's all for I have. For Butler Tech. Yes, for Butler Tech, sorry. We have lots of graduations. <laughs> in the audience right now. Is that all, Mrs. Yes. yes. All right, thank you. Legislative Superintendent and Treasurer, and Mr. D. I really didn't have much in that in that realm, just because the election things have sort of slowed down in terms of anything um, coming out of Columbus um, or DC for that matter, so. Yeah, I have a committee meeting actually in the morning in Columbus, so I might have more to add after tomorrow, but same with Matt, not really anything to add at this time. Mr. D. Uh, talking about um, legislative, I think this is a place I'm going to share some information over the weekend. Um, I was in Columbus for a two day function and uh, I learned a lot as a new board member on how to run board meetings. And one of the most important part that I enjoyed was legislative, uh, legislation and procedures. And um, it's refreshing and it's something that I will take for the rest of my life. Because this business, you have to know what is around you and the update from the state the update from uh, Department of Education and everything happening around. So it was a good opportunity for, for me and I believe that Ms. O'Connor also share a highlight on that. Uh, one other thing that I learned there was also um, update coming from the State House that, that affects, that will affects uh, our students in the, few, in the next few years. That is also very, very important. So that's what I could say on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. D. As, as he noted, he was not there by himself. It was called the Board Leadership Institute. And the nice thing about this professional development is that it's intended for just board members. Our capital conference may be our transportation, it may be child nutrition, it may be administration. Um, but this is intended just for board members and what they feel they would like to learn about. So it's very strong, small group kind of um, professional development. There was a lot of great information. It's always good to compare what's going on with our district with other districts across the states, uh, or across the, the state to determine what they're doing. One thing we did here was that the new organization that OSB will be a part of, since they stepped away from NSB based on some political issues, will be opening up next year with its national events. So that'll be great to see that. There was, as Mr. D said, um, lots of good information and a really solid legislative update, which we will post up on board docs for the rest of the board to see. And I think that covers it. It is actually. Okay, anything else? Is, is there a chance, <clears throat> you mentioned the new national group, is there a chance to, for Lakota to have a voice in fr forming that, shaping that? Well, I would say that's very likely, Mr. Miller. That's a good idea. Yes. Just as they're starting out, it might be good. Well, one, one, let, me, let me say something. One good, one good thing about the uh, organization is every school district can bring whatever idea they have to share with other school districts. So if you go in there, especially for the conference in November, mm -hmm. whatever you want to do in your, I mean, other school district want to learn from your school district, mm -hmm. you are allowed to submit that in. Um, I love it from our highlight tonight on 
uh, cyber security and how successful this this uh, student is. Mm -hmm. That could be one of the things that we will share mm -hmm. because the staff over here said that Lakota is leading the way in the whole country. Yeah. We should be proud of that. Right. It's one of the things we need to be share, sharing in uh, sharing there for others to know Lakota is also in the map. Agreed. Were they part of our student spotlight? Were they part of the student spotlight at Capital Conference this year, the Cyber Academy? Yes, I believe they were. Yes, they yeah, were. So they yeah, were. they were one of four see, groups represented by we got to for see showcase them. So that was fun. You're right. Yeah. Nice to show everybody. It's nice to show off. We do also have some work to do. We've got a little bit of student achievement from across the district that we could um, mm -hmm. put forward at the Capital Conference, and they're looking for student achievement for participants. And that is due in by May 18th, I believe. So pretty short notice. We're on it. Have we submitted some? Yeah, we will. Yep. All right. That was my subtle nag to you that we get mm -hmm. that done. So that's all we've got. Any other questions on legislative? Did you say that the OSBA is joining, rejoining the organization? It's a new. Not in any way. No. Okay. Starting their own. It will They're be starting a new own. organization. I okay. think it's up to 22 states at this point that have pulled away from NSBA and that will be initiating this new organization. Okay. Thank you. Without further questions, we will go on to community engagement. Mrs. Casper. Um, was it last two, two weeks ago, or last week? I don't know all the days are running together. We celebrated our wonderful volunteers at the Barbazoo ceremony, um, 23 schools or 22 schools and our district winner, which was Lakota Cares. And so that's always a nice ceremony. DPC does a nice job of recognizing our schools and the principals give, give an, do a nice job of talking about the recipients and the things that they've done. Although some of our principals, I think might want to be stand up comedians, just saying. <laughs> there was some joking going on but that's always a nice ceremony so we're glad to get that with that wrapped up dpc for the year and then thursday is our last president's council meeting for the year i think it's zoom jenny's going to do some financials did you also want to talk about the community engagement for facilities <coughs> oh, sure i would love to um we talked our master's facility meeting prior to this and we are starting on may 31st with our first community engagement for the master's facility plan so there'll be an opportunity to walk through a building to be able to see the options the four options that we have narrowed it down to so far there will be a thought exchange that will be in conjunction with all of them as well as a short video explaining each one of them before the thought exchange thought exchange so there'll be may 31st june First and sixth. June first and second. So there'll be a June different sixth. buildings. June sixth. Sixth. Yeah. That's what I said. <laughs> June sixth. So there'll be at three different buildings and there will be more information on our website, right, Betsy? Um, probably tomorrow. So it'll give you an opportunity to get started. That's just the beginning of the community engagement that we plan for master's facility. Um, there will be a lot of opportunity between now and when we pick the final plan for the community to weigh in. Thing. All right. Anything else under board reports? Seeing nothing, we'll move to, move to number nine, administrative reports. I will take we'll take these separately, board. So we'll do our first read of the 2023-2024 school calendar. Mr. Mr. Vogelman. Vogelman. Here he comes, calendar god. Good evening, board. Superintendent Miller, Treasurer Logan. Uh, it is that time of year where we start looking at school calendar. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody that this is the 23-24 school calendar. The 22-23 school calendar was approved last year at this time and has been on our website for about 11 months. So this is not for the upcoming fall. This is working about uh, 16 months in advance for the following school year. Continuing with our normal process, the District Parent Council met on Wednesday, March 2nd to design this first draft for the 23-24 school year. Parent representatives worked in six different teams to represent each of our grade band buildings. We had ECS representation, elementary, junior high, and high school, as well as our LEA leadership to review past calendars, the rules surrounding House Bill 59, which deals with minimum hours, uh, what counts as school days, what does not, uh, and current approved contract language within our uh, Lakota Education Association and our Lakota Support Staff Association, along with current calendar practices to help in the creation of this draft. Some critical drivers that some people may not be aware of that kind of helps us in doing this is we've had a strong push 
over the past decade or so to make sure that we end first semester by winter break uh, due to the fact that our high school students usually take semester exams. Uh, they don't want them to wait to have a two week break and then come back and get into exam mode um, after taking some time off. So we strive to be done by winter break of the first semester. So typically when that happens, then we also strive to balance our quarters. We can't have one quarter be 38 days and another quarter be 51, especially if you're balancing semesters. Our high schools and junior highs have semester classes. If one happens to be first semester and it's only 73 days, the second semester, that same class is 103 days. Uh, that's not ideal. We want to seek that balance. And also something with the 2024 school year is it is a leap year. So that is taken into account too when you start adding up days and figuring out where they go. Um, so what we did is we took all of those different seven submissions and put them into a spreadsheet right here. And we take the most common dates that were submitted amongst those seven groups that I mentioned. And basically the, the winner is the one that shows up the most. And so you start with that first teacher work day and you work away all the way through trying to keep balance, looking at typical days such as our conference exchange dates that happen before Thanksgiving uh, weekend and President's weekend, as well as our contract language with having professional development days at the end of each quarter. Uh, one thing that was unique to this calendar that we've heard some feedback about it over the past couple of years, but this year it showed up in about four different representations of the desire for a small fall break. So you will notice uh, at the end of first quarter, there's an additional day in there, additional two days for families with a small fall break. So as per House Bill 59, uh, no action needs to be done tonight. This is similar to our, like our policy first reads. Uh, then according to the rules, it has to go on to our website for public feedback. We will notify our parents uh, via principal emails and district communications to solicit that feedback on this draft. Uh, then after 30 days, the executive team will review all the input that comes in, make any appropriate changes. I think Mr. Miller mentioned one we're looking at uh, right now about looking at that primary date of um, moving any dates around and then it'll be presented back to you in June for a second read and approve. Any questions on the calendar? Not a question, but a request. Sure. I would like to see, and I know we've already approved it, but a, a change to next year's calendar to also look at mm -hmm. election Primaries. dates and when our schools are open yep. and being used as polling places and maybe we could come back at the same time with. Sure. Yes, I believe we, we did that last year at this time too, when we, uh, we altered we a couple did. of dates. Yep. Would also, appreciate it if we could do that. Sure. Also, um, December 26th, is that a holiday? It, it is a holiday by rules because you get Christmas in the day after. Okay. So, so that's why that is green. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The district is closed that day. Mr. D, Mrs. Schaefer, Mrs. Casper, anything? Nothing. Thank you, Mr. Vogelman. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> We'll move to the five-year forecast. Mrs. Lohman. I'm handing out the grid. If you recall the last uh, board meeting, we had a work session and we talked about any concerns that we need to address or we need to discuss before we head into actually having the five-year forecast on the agenda to approve. And so what I've done is compiled the things I heard, put it onto the grid. I have some of these things that I want to give you some feedback on tonight. Um, and then we'll talk about how we might address and get to a point where um, the board feels like we have answered the questions or at least discussed the concerns that might be included here. So let's start with class sizes. I know when that came up in the um, work session, I said, you know, is this elementary? And the response back was district-wide. We really want to look at class sizes district-wide. Well, th this is my action step that I have written down that, you know, we probably should look at what does the data show us now? and evaluate what actually is existing right now, and then talk about how do we feel about that? <laughs> and then talk about um, what concerns we still have, along with, you know, I know we have policy that, that sets, you know, goals on that. We've done some work on 
setting some ranges instead of just that 24 to one as an example. Um, but I will say this is something that is going to take some time to gather the data that we believe that you'll want to look at, evaluate it. And, and, and we already know as we talked, and most people weren't here for this part, but when we talked at the master facilities plan, we're already tight. We know we're really tight at several buildings, but Cherokee, Van Gordon being two, which are going to have modulars next year, um, which they haven't had um, in a while. So I think that's part of the conversation. That's why I sent you um, today the anticipated class sizes for next year. But to your point, it's going to be an ongoing conversation. So I, I believe probably the way that you know, we can't just leave it that way, right? We, we probably need to say, okay, when are we going to talk about this and what kind of pieces of data um, does the board wish to take a look at? So I think there's more to this. Yep. Um, and so Matt and I can put our heads together, but we're not going to have this answered <laughs> by the end of this month. It, but it's a concern. It's something, it's an ongoing concern at, like Matt said, as we're talking about our master's facilities plan, um, it's part of that as well. Our purchase services, I know this question came up and really doing a, a dive into that line item to better understand what's included in that line item. Um, curricul curriculum and instruction was specifically mentioned. Um, as we are gearing down the end of this year, I mean, we're, we're at the beginning of May, the end of June is our end of fiscal year. So as we get closer to that date, we're gonna have more information. And so this is something that quite honestly, I think we can take a look at our five-year forecast document and those notes, those assumptions, and we break down those different items included in purchase services. And maybe there's something that we want to pull out of there and drill down into it even more. Um, so I think that action steps here is, as we get those more detailed information, I will pass that along. Maybe in the assumptions, we can break some of those things out a little bit more and see how you like that um, and continue to work on that. We can make some changes and some improvements there. High school busing was brought up for 10 through 12. And I did check with Mr. Passage uh, today. That additional cost would be about $2 million. But I will say in conversations, it isn't just a cost issue on this one. It's also about the limited number of drivers we would have, additional buses that we would need. Um, when we went, and it increased freshman busing, we had to extend our parking lot. Mm -hmm. so, so it's more than just that $2 million figure, but that would be the start. I have a question. Sure. So you're saying we have to extend our parking lot? We, had to, we had to extend the parking lot when we increased our transportation to freshman busing because we had to have more buses to transport the additional students. And so what I'm saying is we would need to evaluate that whether the parking lot that we extended is large enough for the additional buses we would need for 10 through 12. How many years ago did we stop busing the high schoolers? That so 2012, 11? We made those budget cuts. And did we have to extend the parking lot then, or should the parking lot suffice with the 2011? So they're talking about additional buses, so you have to consider, do we need the capital change, facilities changes? So Which additional compared to our 2011 busing contract. That's when we did decreasing. Yeah. But if we're bringing more back, then we have to consider, can we accommodate that? Well, and I feel like if the community needs this, I think then this it, this makes it better for our students. I think then maybe we might need to look into this a little bit more and not just brush it off because it's you know two million dollars and 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 the other cases. Like if this is something that the community needs and will make it better and easier on our parents and for their for the students' education, then I think we should definitely look into it. 
Let's keep in mind too that in 2011, when we cut buses, most of the buses that we were sending to and from schools were more than half empty. So we were we were sending a full bus to a high school that was more than half empty because the problem is you ask the the parent, you know, do you want to use the bus service? And of course, because they're not sure what their situation will be, everybody does say yes. But then in the end, with extracurricular activities, they have to stay after school for sports. We found that most of the buses were more than half empty going to and from the schools. And I understand that. How many students would be even eligible for that in 10 through 12? Do we have any idea? We, we can dig further into this. Um, and it's like everything else. You, you, can, you can add services, you could add on transportation, but just know that you know, you're looking at at least $2 million additional each year. And it's about prioritizing. If that is the priority of this district and this board, um, then I'm not that person to say no to you. I am that person to say, here's what the costs are, here's what the concerns with that would be, and is that the priority for the district? And it's not just busing for our students that are in, within our schools, it's also busing for, I believe at the last count, it was 30 different private schools that if we bus to internally, we would need to bus to all of those as well, which is additional Can cost. you explain why we would have to bus if we decided to do high school state wide, law. We would law, the state law, okay. Yeah. Oh, yep. um, and the other question, my rebuttal to the fact that there was not a, enough students to fill the buses, since 2011, we have grown significantly. So that may not be the case. And considering the um, economy and how it is, it might be more beneficial to have that for, for our students. And I think maybe this is something that we could do a survey. And mm -hmm. if I, you know, it's not needed from the community, then I won't talk about it again. But if it is, because I have heard a lot of it myself that the community does want the busing, that it would be, you know, very helpful. So again, we could do a survey and, and see what that results are, the results are. Well, there's a lot more discussion that, that you all can have as well as the strategic plan. You're gonna be updating that um, as well. Yeah, so. and, and we're not brushing it off. It's one of the no. things that we'll consider moving forward. I mean, we've, I mean, it, it's come up, it comes up almost every year. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think it's important to take a little bit of a deeper dive into our finances and see if there's anything that we can reevaluate to provide this for our students. Okay. So uh, my understanding is uh, in your previous surveys, um, parents give you response that at the end they turn change their minds or what did it end up that we had to drop it i think too and um chris is going to come up in just a minute and he can he can um speak to this much better than i can since that's his role um but i think by law if we provide transportation for a grade level we have to have enough seats um for those students who would be bused too so um in addition to the survey. So no matter if someone says yes or no, I think we still have to have a seat for them, uh, regardless if we did that. He, he will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, and I could be wrong, but that's why he does what he does. Let me make a suggestion in the interest of moving on and not to be making a pun, but we'll put it in the parking lot for future discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll let him talk about it when he comes up. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Because there's not, there isn't currently a way that we could get ourselves ready to do busing right. next year for 10 to 12. Correct. Right, you would be looking at the following school year, so you'd have more time to dig into it. Um, the next on our list that I had written down is our diversity department, Lodi, um, and the cost of the Lodi department to share that with the Board of Education. And so I did some drilling down into that. And so we have Mr. Card and about 40% of his time is spent in that department. And then he wears a few other hats. <laughs> so 40% of his time, we do have um, Ms. Moore, who works in that department. We have a small amount of expenses that's less than $1,500. Um, and then we have some, we have champions in each building, and they 
are eligible to submit time um, and to get paid for that additional time that they're spending in their buildings on that. Um, and we have only, we've spent less than 2,500 on that. So in all, we're less than 200,000. It's like $194,000 for that. Does that include their salaries? Yes, that's all in. And is Mrs. Moore, um, is this her only position? With that is correct, 100% of her time, yes. And where else does um, Mr. Card spend his time? So he's the ombudsman for the district. So he works with parents and families when issues come up between school and home. Uh, that's a big part of it. Another big part, especially right now, is he's our hearing officer for suspension and expulsion hearings. So he does that too. So he had um, Mr. Spurlock, who um, retired just last year. He has his role, which was ombudsman and then the hearing officer, plus the, what you say, 40% of Lodi as well. Has this all, how many years has uh, Elgin Carr been the budsman and a representative? Uh, he, so last year, Mr. Spurlock retired, but he had some overlap last year with Mr. Spurlock. So this would be year two, I believe. So you've always had that position. And We've had always had, into, well, not always, but ombudsman for a long time, years. How, years, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just trying to understand. No, you're, no, no apology needed. Um, and then the ex, the expulsion meetings, is that mm -hmm. for court, in court cases? No, that's, or that that's just, just for, in, in district. It can district. lead that way, but it's for students that have uh, disciplinary right. issues. Okay, thank you. Sure. Moving down our list, um, permanent improvement needs. You know, we've mentioned more than one time that we are in the process of a mas master's facilities plan. Um, back in 2013, the last levy that was um, approved was a three and a half mil operating and two mils PI. We are right now, our permanent improvement fund um, is sustainable, but if we do not move forward and address the facilities needs of our district, two mills is not going to be enough to address the needs that we have for our facilities. So Mr. Adi, I believe you were the one that brought this up and it does, it is a conversation that needs to go hand in hand as we're talking about our facilities plan. And so I would suggest as we move along, maybe at the next facilities meeting, I can bring a, I can show you how much we've spent in our PI fund since it began, where we're at now, and then looking forward, what am I projecting for the future of that fund? So I can add that to our facilities meeting next time. A professional recommendation when I bring the five-year forecast forward, I will share my thoughts and um, suggestions. It will be my last for this district, so I will share um, with you what, I, what I'm thinking. Um, OHSAA, I did look into this and I, I had a discussion um, with Mr. Kaufman, who also is in a leadership position. Um, with that group as well. What we pay to OHSAA is $50 per sport. And we have 24 sports for East and West. So the total that we're paying district-wide is $2,400. Our ESSER impact When um, part of the five-year forecast in those notes, I will share with you, here are the positions that we're currently paying that will need to come back on the forecast and what year that those will come back on the forecast. We do have some positions that we are paying out of ESSER right now um, that we believe will be absorbed into other things and not we won't need to bring it onto the forecast. So there will be some positions that we, we, we believe will they will go away, if you will. Sunset. Sunset, that's the word I was looking for. 
Our social emotional learning, um, Mr. Miller has talked about sharing that presentation with you that um, Ms. Brown did a few months ago. So we believe that will answer some questions. Um, and then our spending deficit, when you look at that draft, we can talk about it then if there's you know, more to discuss. But again, I'm trying to answer the things that I believe I can answer before we get to that draft that you will see the draft by this Friday. Um, and then once you look at that, I ask each of you to reach out to me if you have questions. I am happy to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and answer any questions you have about the document before we get ready to approve the five-year forecast. I will say that the assumptions are what drives the forecast. We, we make the, the assumptions and then the numbers are applied to that. I did not hear any concerns in our last meeting that would change big changes to our assumptions in this five-year forecast. But once you see the document and you see the draft, then you can express, hey, I know I didn't express this when we were in the you know work session, but I have a I have a concern about this and we'll we'll work through it. Um, I really am trying to make this as conversational as possible, as possible um, so that we really can um, improve on this document because it is something that we use. It's I, a planning tool. It's important. I had a question or an adjustment on the SEL. I was concerned about, or I just wanted information regarding the costs and where they come from. Um, and is, do ESSER dollars have any contracts with them when we receive the ESSER dollars? Do we sign a contract where they will be spent on certain things? And I would like to see if there are any contracts with the funds regarding SEL. Because I do have information from the Ohio Department of Education. It says there are no federal or state laws in Ohio that require local school districts comply with the SEL standards that were approved by the State Board of Education in 2019. They were developed as part of the strategic plan, Each Child, Our Future, a project led by former state representative, Fialo Damara. So um, I know you sent the, the standards um, for SEL, but they're not state standards. They're standards when you are choosing to um, teach SEL. If there is any, we have the opportunity to say no. And generally there is, money tied to SEL and implementing that into your school system? Well, in, into our school system, but um, one of the things that I would ask from you is which part of SEL um, are we doing that you don't think is good for our kids? Um, I'm open to giving up to um, having a community discussion with that. We've had them in the past. I'm just curious if you could give us some indication of what Parts you want us to take a look at. I, I, um, it, let, let me. Can I chime in a little bit? Sure. Okay. Um, I know this presentation. The presentation on SEL was mm -hmm. done. Was it in October or so last year? Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad you brought it back. That we're going to do. We're going to do the representation again, right? You're suggesting that we we do the presentation. Well, we can, I think it's recorded. Mm -hmm. We can always bring her back. It's it recorded. Okay, we can show it to you again. Okay. Sure. In my in my observation and personal opinion is we need to go back to that. I know after that presentation, that is when a lot of questions or concerns can come up. Because I know I wasn't sitting here when that sure. uh, presentation was made. And I've also expressed my concern based on information that maybe I might have it right or wrong. So to save us time, I'll I'll plea, I'll make a plea. Let's wait for this presentation. And then other questions that will come up, which one will be is what options do we have? What options does the community have? Mm -hmm. What options do parents have on this? From there, we can go forward. But now a lot of things are not clear. 
So let me send the link out again to the yes. board and that, that'll help. And then we can kind yes. of go from there. Yes. And prior Nothing to that. Nothing else, it's a refresher for all of us. Yeah. Prior to that, I mm -hmm. also want to make a request. If we can send those information to the students and their parents prior to the presentation again, that way when parents are coming, they're coming with informed yep. information and then bring their questions. That's, I think I get it. I think maybe post on the website so the parents can see it. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Okay. Okay, please. Thank you. I will say though, as far as the cost associated with SEL is a little more difficult. With Lodi, we actually have, you know, people and a department that is Lodi. With SEL, it's more um it's harder to pull out those exact costs. So I think that's gonna, that's going to um, require more conversations about exactly what those costs would look like. Can I get a, a copy of any contracts regarding SEL that the school has signed to participate in teaching SEL or, or having that program in our school system? And I, I'm not saying no, yes, but I'm even struggling on trying to pinpoint. We would just need to go through and say, is, is this contract SEL or is it Hold something I. else? Or so. Yeah, if you could, help, would us, need if you could to, help us narrow it down, it would, it would be good. We can. Anything with the word SEL, social and emotional learning, is what I'm interested in. Okay. Would you like to discuss that further at a different point with Mrs. Bodie? Sure. Mm -hmm. Anything further? That's all I had for tonight. Once you see the numbers um, at the end of this week, you will get that in an email from me. Please reach out if you have additional questions. But again, this is going to be an ongoing conversation. This is not just something that's going to be settled by the time we approve the five-year well, There's forecast. a lot more wrapped up in here than, than just budgetary issues, obviously. Absolutely. I mean, my job as the CFO is not to make the priorities and to say yes or no on an expense. My job is to take the strategic plan and to make sure that our resources are aligned to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as those priorities change, then to make sure that the budget and the resources are aligned to fulfill that. So that's what I've tried to do and I will continue to do. I have another question. Sure. Right. Um, is there a cap on expenses? So I was wondering about those the boards that we put at the playgrounds, which are, I'm so glad that we could do that. I was... Being, I was prepared for that to be brought to the attention of the board. So is there like a cap spent of if maybe if there's like $30,000, then that has to be approved by the board or is there, what, what is that? What does that look like? It's in policy. It is. So the policy that we have um, says that myself, first of all, with contracts, myself or Chris Passage, the COO can sign contracts on behalf of the district but if it extends beyond one year, those have to be brought to the Board of Education. And I believe um, there used to be a dollar threshold of 25,000, but I think now it is the term of that. If it's beyond one year, that we need to bring those to the Board of Education. Can I get a copy of the contracts that are less than a year that are being brought to the school? Mrs. Bodie, I'm going to make a suggestion. First of all, I would really appreciate it if you'd be recognized by the chair before you continue to ask questions. It sounds like there's a list of information you're looking for. Could you please send that to our superintendent and treasurer? I'm sure they would be happy to accommodate. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Logan, anything further? I don't think so, not, not tonight. I did want to add one thing that I think I may have been the only board member that requested it, but about five weeks ago, I asked it for an update to our spreadsheet on staffing mm -hmm. and still looking for that as part of this discussion. Yep. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It is the biggest driver for our expenses. So clearly it, it's important to our discussion. It absolutely is. And that's why I believe this whole class size conversation is all part of that because the big spreadsheet that you're discussing um, is how you can first determine what is here now. Mm. So, yes. So as soon as we have that information, um, rather than waiting until our approval date, that would be great if we could see that. Yeah, we're not putting that off. We're just working on what the staffing issues are going to be with the class sizes. So completely I think it understand. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would appreciate it as soon as you can. Yep. And it looked like the last thing you sent us, you are already making plans to address some of those early childhood school staffing concerns and class size concerns. So I know that's already being built into the board. Correct. Yep. Thank you for with what you said us. reminding us. Board, is there any other information that we do not have that we think we need to have prior to the five year forecast approval? Madam Chair, I would like some um, clarification. Mm -hmm. So she just spoke I'm sorry. without addressing you first. So what, would you please give us the poly, uh, give Schaefer, us an example? Please be recognized. Yes, I please apologize that I was out of order. Thank you. Board, is there anything else? Mr. D. This is Logan. Thank you. We will look forward to this continued discussion. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miller, transportation with Mr. Passage has Sarge. that. He's going to address some of, of that now. Good evening. Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the transportation issues we've had this past year, um, give you an update on some of the things that have happened and some things that we need to look forward to going into next year and some recommendations moving forward. So um, just want to give you a little um, snapshot of our current services. So right now we, we service a little uh, over 14,000 students. And it's broken down by close to 9,000 public students, th over 3,200 special ed students and 25, over 2,500 community and non-public students. Currently, we provide transportation to all 23 Lakota schools. Um, some of you may question, even though we don't uh, provide transportation to grades 10 through 12, we do provide special education transportation to the main campuses as well. So that's why they are included in this number. In addition to the 23 Lakota schools, we transport to 29 community and non-public schools. We started this year with 205 routes. Uh, we currently are down to 195. We've had two combined routes where possible, eliminate routes. Um, and some of that has created additional um, drive times and ride times for students to do this. A lot of it that is due to our staffing issues, which I'll address here in a little bit. Currently we have 19 van routes. They support special education needs of students that are unable to ride a yellow school bus. And our homeless students um, are also transported via van most of the times. There are 21 routes um, that have at least one supporting tier for, for community and public, uh, non-public schools. And what that means is typically when we route our buses, we do three tiers. So we'd have a tier for, to give you a, an easy example. We have a tier that would do our junior highs, then we'll come back and do our elementary schools and come back and do our ECS schools. So that would be a three tier uh, bus. And that's the most efficient way to, to route those and do that. So you have one bus doing multiple things throughout the day. So right now we have 21 buses that are have support of at least um, um, non-public schools and community schools. And we have 23 um, buses that are dedicated strictly to non-public and community schools out of the uh, 195 we currently have. So um, there's a little bit of discussion about this earlier during the uh, presentation with Mr. Logan. So we must provide students uh, in grades K through eight that are eligible um, for transportation by Ohio law. Services in grades nine through 12 are not required by Ohio law. We must provide transportation to students who have an IEP with transportation as a related service. Um, we are only required to provide transportation to and from the residents. We go well beyond that. We provide to Boys and Girls Club, daycares. We, so we go above and beyond what we're, we're required to do by law. Um, and service to eligible community and non-public schools like services, which I'll get to here in one second. So eligibility, eligibility for K-8 is all kids or students living 
two miles or more uh, of a drive distance from their school of attendance. Um, so if you live within two mile drive time, we're not required to provide transportation by law. Um, we have, oh, that's me. <laughs> Sounds like the ice cream. Sounds like we in the meeting. Um, sorry. Um, so if you lived within two miles uh, of the school, we're not required by law to transport students by law. We go well beyond that. We do have some areas that are conducive to walking, like Endeavor. So those students that live within that two mile and have sidewalks and walkways to the school, we do, we do not provide transportation. But schools such as Van Gordon, where we do not have any sidewalks or walkways, we do not um, go within that two mile uh, drive time. So it varies based on specifics of the uh, geography of the school. Um, for community and non-public schools, by law, we are required to transport them if they are within a 30 minute drive time of their school of attendance. So if they attended Lakota West High School or Lakota West Freshman, it would have to be within a 30 minute bus drive, the most direct route during normal school hours to qualify. So that's the eligibility for non-public schools. And for like services, this is where it comes in. If we provide like transportation, oh, excuse me, transportation services to like we do right now, our ninth grade students, we got to provide that same transportation to all eligible non-public and community schools for ninth grade. So that's what that like services means. Again, if you have any questions through this presentation, feel free to stop and ask. I have a question. Sure. Madam President, let's go ahead. Um, what is the cost on the van route supporting special education? Would it be, I wanna know like cost effective wise, would it be co more cost effective to have an actual bus or, or the van or the vans. Like, I just wanna know what would be the best option. It's really situational based on the student. The students are eligible or can ride a, a school bus. We, we put those students on school buses because we do have um, buses that have uh, chair lifts or other needs to help kids with mobility issues. But some students, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they don't do well with others on a the bus. They can't handle all the environmental surroundings. So they are better suited to be transported in a van. And that's really done on a case by case basis to best meet the needs of that student. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So some of the challenge we've, we've had over, over the past two plus years is with the um, COVID pandemic and the low um, workforce participation rates over the past um, couple of years, we've really struggled to um, fulfill our staffing uh, with transportation specifically. Um, you know, we've, we've had issues for custodians, food service, um, substitute teachers at times this year. So we've really had a struggle um, providing um, employees for this area. And as of right now, when I talk to my peers across the, uh, across the area, all of us are struggling to find quality bus drivers, maintain quality bus drivers. And from the industry experts that you talk to at ODE and from national wide organizations, they don't foresee this uh, issue going away. It's not unique to Lakota or Ohio, but there is an issue with um, drivers moving forward. <coughs> you know, I've worked very closely with our contractor, Peterman, to look at ways they can be more proactive. Um, they've done a great job looking at um, signing bonuses, retention bonuses, referral bonuses. You know, they've offered paid training for uh, drivers to do the, the whole process. Um, they guarantee subs that they're gonna get a certain number of hours to make sure they stay as a sub and, um, and don't get disencouraged by a uh, low number of hours. So. They've done a lot of these things, but we really have not seen any drastic improvement in um, the number of qualified employees we can hire. So we will continue to look at that. So some of the other impacts that we've had, all drivers that pass their training, and typically in years past, if they pass their training, you know, they're a sub for a while, and they, as routes come available, they're, they're put into a regular route. Right now, anybody who's trained or passes their certification, they are put on a route immediately. So we really do not have a sub pool of drivers at all. Um, all of our office staff that have a CDL license, they are often assigned to uh, routes to make sure that they're covered. So that leaves um, their daily responsibilities as administration lacking, whether it's answering telephones, uh, doing administrative reports, doing training and those type of things. So those are all struggles that they're uh, facing right now as well. Um, there are a few days when we actually have all routes covered, and I'll get into that here in a minute to give you some overview of that. And a lot of times, 
Um, we'll have calls that when we know that driver's gonna be out for a medical issue or some other issue, we'll try to give parents and families a heads up that, hey, your bus isn't gonna be available these next couple of days. But sometimes it's the morning of, and we don't get that, um, that uh, call until that morning of and have no other recourse but to cancel that route. Um, and right now we're unable to provide transportation services for some of our field trips and many of our extracurricular activities are reliant on the parents to get them to and from those activities. And, and I just wanna, it's not up here, but just talking to our transportation team, it's just been a rough year overall, just in a lot of different areas as far as, you know, we've, we've had a unfortunate couple of bus drivers pass away during the school year. We've had spouses of bus drivers pass away. We've had, it just seems like everything that could go wrong has gone wrong this year to add to the, the complex, but um, it's just not all COVID related is what I wanted to get to at that point. Um, some other impacts we have right now is um, the, we have some routes are have low ridership or disproportionate are using our resources. Um, so we have some buses that are transporting less than 10 kids to their schools on a daily basis. So that's using up an entire resource um, that's uh, very not very uh, cost ineffective. Um, going back to the conversations you had earlier, um, for high school students, particularly the freshmen, you know, they sign up a lot of times thinking they want to use transportation and they don't end up using it. The parents will say, hey, I'll sign them up. I don't think I'm going to use it, but if I, if I get in trouble, I can't pick them up. I want them to have a ride. And it really doesn't work like that. It's not a you call, we haul type of situation. <laughs> you call, you haul. Um, so when we get to request, we, we, we plan it out through the year. And throughout the year, kids drop off. They find different rides. They have extracurricular activities, you name it. But the ridership really decreases, um, even at the freshman level. We see it more so at the 10, 12 level, where as soon as a student gets their license, you know, they they drive to school or ride with a friend. So you, you see that um, really drop off at the 10, 12 level as well. That's been our experience throughout the years. Um, <clears throat> on multiple occasions throughout this year, we've had buses that would go down to schools to pick up um, students um, and there'll be no students to be, to be picked up. They either have extracurricular activities found on the way home and they don't inform us. We have no way to know. So we have a bus that could have been used on a route that was canceled going down to a high school to pick up a student. And, there, and there's no one to ride. And that happens um, more often than you would think. Unlike uh, in district routes, all those ones that we have in district, um, we're able to um, combine and do things differently with, when they're in district. And you'll, you'll see example of that here in a second. But for those um, routes that are beyond our district boundaries, it's really hard to combine or do routes um, with that. Because if you look at the next slides here, I know that's a little bit hard to see. But basically, since November, we've been tracking number of routes that have been canceled on a daily basis. So we're averaging um, anywhere from the teens to the low 20s, a number of routes that are impacted. And if you go back to my example earlier, we talk about a route that's canceled. We're talking about, in some cases, three tiers. So that's over 100 kids that are impacted by one bus yeah. being out every day. So as we look at that, um, we really struggle. Uh, we've been struggling with that the last few years. Uh, or last year um, in particular. Um, and going back to combining routes, you know, we see at, um, AM uh, routes combined, AM PM routes combined. What our transportation does, and I give a shout out to Sue Pruitt, Ken Stevenson, and Kelly Mead, they do a great job of looking at, you know, if we have any excess capacity in any bus, they try to um, look at how we can add 10 more kids to this bus, five more kids to this bus, six more, and try to get those kids rerouted. It's not the most efficient way to do it. It adds time to everybody's ride, but it beats canceling a route. So every time you see a route that's been combined, that's saving a route that would have been canceled. So if you look at those numbers, they're, they're quite significant as well. And that's just through the, the February through April of this year. So the summary of the impact over the last six months, we've had over 1,100 routes canceled, uh, morning routes and over 1,000 routes canceled in the afternoon. Again, we've done from a transportation point, trying to combine routes, you know, 363 in the morning, over 700 in the afternoon. So make sure those students have a ride to or from school when possible. 
We are in jeopardy of losing additional state funding due to route cancellations with the House Bill 110. There's new requirements within House Bill 110 that if we're unable to meet those obligations, the district can come back and have their daily funding taken away for those routes. So we're in jeopardy of that uh, moving forward. And really the main point for, for me this evening is really our, our current operations, our projected operations are really not sustainable and would recommend some changes that I wanna talk about here in a minute. Mr. Besarge, my understanding was that that house bill doesn't take into account bus driver shortages, doesn't take into account any of the pandemic issues or any of that, is that correct? There's there are no exceptions to that. There is strictly, if you don't, don't provide the service, then you can be um, penalized for that. Okay, So, Madam yeah. Chair. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question regarding, we contract, we have a contract with our busing service. Mm -hmm. Would this, would it improve the data if we, Resource out or resource out outsource to another um, busing company. Is this something that is from the? Is this an issue because of who we have a contract with? It is not. When I talk to my peers, whether they're in house or contracted out throughout the surrounding Greater Cincinnati, even in Columbus, I was just in Columbus for a statewide meeting, and it is the same issue regardless of your urban, suburban, rural school district. There is just a struggle to retain bus drivers, regardless of it's an in house operation or a, a contracted operation like ourselves. Do you have a cause of why it's been a struggle? Can I, can I, can I chip in there to help? Um, I've worked in a company where I manage drivers. I love you drivers. I love you, okay? But I'm telling you the hardest people to manage are drivers. So it's a very common thing that uh, is going to keep occurring. So, the thing is, you have to count your cost. Drivers are very, very hard to manage. So would you say it's a personnel issue or would you say? Uh, from my perspective, it's a function of the job itself. It's hard to find people to come in to do three hours in the morning, go home for a period of time to come back and do three hours in the afternoon. It takes a person that has that kind of time flexibility in their jobs. Um, most of the time, it's not a full-time job. We offer benefits for them, but most of the time, it's not a full-time job. So it's anywhere from four to six to seven hours. Sometimes some of the longer routes will get up to eight hours a day, but most of the times those routes are not considered full-time as far as the number of hours you would get to, to maintain that. So it's, it's just a struggle to find people to want to take those types of jobs for that type of time frame. Our, our pay is very competitive. You know, we look at our pay scale compared to our surrounding districts. Um, you know, people are looking at that and they're not trying to give an extra dollar here if it's just more straight stealing from a, it's, it's everyone sort of understands it's, it's a issue amongst all districts, regardless if you're contracted or in-house operation. Okay, thank you. Sure. So um, some of my recommendations moving forward, um, oops, sorry. That's great when it works. Um, there are seven community, several community and non-public schools that have been identified as over that 30 minute drive time. So as I stated before, there are requirements when ORC, if you're more than 30 minutes from your school of residence, if you attend the Lakota would be ineligible. So we've gone through and looked at all the schools that um, we have currently provided transportation to or have in the past and did a route run on all those and these schools have been identified as being ineligible moving forward based on the drive time uh, requirement ORC. So our recommendation would be not to provide transportation services for these schools moving forward. Another consideration is looking at um, Ohio Revised Code gives boards the authority to determine based on various factors, if it is impractical to drive a student who is otherwise eligible for transportation so um, one of the things we want to look at are those routes that are underutilized, um, routes that are taking a, a long period of time to get to, can only do one tier worth of, um, of work. Uh, the cost to transport, you know, as the cost of diesel goes up more and more, is it really cost ineffective to transport students that are um, 25, 30, or under that 30 minute rule? So, 
Ohio Revised Code gives us the ability to look at those schools and determine if it's impractical and offer what they call payment in lieu of transportation to those families. So it's saying that even though you're eligible for transportation, it's not practical for one or more of these reasons up here. And we would offer you a payment in lieu of providing transportation to you. And that is statutory in Ohio Revised Code. So students who are eligible um, attend our charter, non-public community schools, vocational schools, and even if we wanted to look at our own internal schools here, you could offer payment in lieu of for Lakota schools if you want to, wanted to look at that going forward. So based on the six criteria um, I just looked at before, um, the following schools are being recommended to be offered payment in lieu of moving forward. So these schools fall within that 30 minute, 30 minute eligibility time frame. So they are eligible to receive transportation, but from a practicality standpoint, more times than not, there's less than 10 students on these buses. The buses, um, when we think about routing for schools like this, you, for Lakota schools, you have an attendance zone. We have Adena, so the kids live in a close proximity. When you attend a, a non-public school, you attendance zone is the entire district. And to route and pick up kids, that you may have less than 10 kids over 63 square miles is very um, time consuming and very cost ineffective. So um, it would be my recommendation to look forward to making these schools impractical and offering payment to these parents in lieu of providing transportation to them. Some changes in House Bill 110 that are, are new that are supposed to help public schools with the routing efforts is all um, Community and non-public schools are supposed to provide to uh, the, the school districts their start and end times for their school districts. So we can start the routing. Um, they're supposed to do that by April 1st. And by June 1st, we're supposed to be able to go through and do our routing. As I stand here today, I've had one non-public community school provide me that information. And it's required by law. So. I have reached out to our ODE representative and asked about what does it mean if it's in law and I get no response back from any of the schools, what are our obligations? Um, and if they do provide it late, um, what does make an attempt to provide transportation mean? So of course, sometimes legislature isn't the clearest, it's up for interpretation. So I'm reaching out to get further clarification from ODE on what this really means. So I, I think the uh, legislators had a good intention by trying to put this in, in law to help um, things be more efficient and to help parents with this, but right now it's not working as it should. <clears throat> so by law, we're required to make any kind of um, payment in lieu of determination 30 days before the start of school. Um, again, House Bill 110 authorizes the superintendent to, to deem that and at the next board meeting, um, it would bring those back for approval um, for uh, payment in lieu of. So um, I'll go through the process and how that works here in a second. It's not, I'm almost done. So changes that are amount. So the also, law also changed in the prior years. We only we paid $250 to those families. Now law requires you to pay at least a minimum of 50% of their previous year's uh, cost. Um, last year, that, that was around $530. And once a new update comes out, they're looking somewhere between the $550 and $600 range is the estimates for right now. Um, House Bill 110 also permits the community or non-public school to act on behalf of students that may um, be impacted. Um, the district can only respond to parents that have made a timely request to this and non-public schools uh, may represent only those students um, that have requested it through their office. So the pilot process looks at, once the superintendent um, looks at the factors, we have to provide um, a letter to the parents and guardians uh, with a detailed description of why we are offering payment in lieu of, um, and the parents have the right to accept or deny that payment in lieu of transportation. The board must also provide a contract or an agreement that gives the parents to reject or accept that payment in lieu of. If the guardian accepts the payment in lieu of, we are required to pay up to 50%. Um, um, the board uh, payment may be um, prorated if the student enrolls later in the school year. Uh, district verifies enrollment, not attendance. 
And we, it's also part of our reimbursements too that we can submit for, for on our T reports from the state. So if the parent uh, rejects the pilot offer, they must contact ODE for mediation. Under the new version of the law, non-public schools are authorized um, by the parent or guardian to do it on behalf. Um, if mediation doesn't work out, it goes to the state for a hearing. Um, district must provide transportation until the resolution is reached. Uh, mediation depends on the agreement between the two parties. ODE is not the decision maker. So the reason I'm asking to go through this process now, it is a process. If you look at a school that's going to be declared, if you look at a school itself, then you have all the students that attend that school. You have to send out an individual letter and individual contract to each one of those parents to um, whether they want to accept or deny um, payment in lieu of. If they reject it, there's a whole other process you need to go through. Um, even though we, we have up to 30 days before the start of school, I think doing it now allows parents to plan appropriately, allows a district to plan appropriately, if there are um, any concerns instead of waiting until the start of school to start this process. Sorry. So what does these recommendations really impact? What's that mean? So we have approximately 25 to 30 students that would be ineligible for transportation based on the uh, 30 minute drive rule. Um, we have between 120 to 130 students that would be impacted by um, the impractical declaration. And we have still transport over 2,300 students using Lakota buses. So um, it's a small percentage of the students um, that would be impacted, but it has a large impact on the operation, which you'll see here in a minute. And these numbers are based on historical numbers. Each year is a little bit different about who attends these schools, but based over the years, these are the approximate numbers that would be impacted by the schools that we have listed. So with these changes, we could um, eliminate up to 11 bus routes, um, eliminate five morning shuttles and six afternoon shuttles. So the shuttles, the way they work is, like I said, if you're a non-public school, your attendance boundary is the entire district. So we'll have buses that drive around and pick up students and meet at a central spot to exchange and have one bus take those students to the, to the respective schools. So, so you have buses out doing shuttles to pick up private and parochial schools and community school kids to meet up at a central location, then to transport and get on other buses to go to the respective schools. So those could be um, el eliminated and repurposed for sub drivers or do extracurricular trips or things of that nature that we're unable to do right now. Um, implementing these changes uh, mitigates the chances we would lose additional funding by not providing the routes or having uncovered routes. And the elimination of the 11 buses saves approximately $900,000 a year um, plus fuel. It's hard to determine fuel fuels for diesel fuels getting close to 450 a gallon now. Um, so you look at that. So if you take that and you offset, you know, if we do the payment in lieu of and make those payments, um, so you still have a net savings of, of over $800,000 of expenses year to year mm -hmm. by offering payment in lieu of. What's the timeline for this? Um, the timeline is we would like to start sending those letters out next week to those parents. So they can determine if they want to accept or reject the payment in lieu of. Are those parents aware that this is even coming? No. And that's why I wanted to do it now and not wait for. Yeah. Yeah. Madam President. And that's why the superintendent has the, the, the uh, authority to do that. And typically the way schools do it is to declare it. The first notification a parent get is a letter in the mail. So my opportunity tonight is to sort of preface that and say, this is gonna be coming soon. We want to put it out. I can work with Betsy on additional communications, but a lot of times those parents aren't connected to the school unless they're otherwise used for transportation. So um, so are you looking for formal board approval for this tonight? I am not right now. I'm giving you an update about- What is coming? Madam President is coming. Yes. That, that, so, no, that, so I just want to be clear real, real quick before, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I would like to send out those letters to inform parents that we're going to deem it impractical and they have the responsibility to get it back to us and say, we don't want pilot or we do want pilot. Um, and that would start that whole process. Then 
once we do that in practicality, uh, bring that back to the board for final approval. So. Yeah, it is a lot more students than we've done before. Say so that again. It's a lot more students than normally are involved in this process. Correct. What are there further questions? Yes, I had a question on the, the students that would um, become ineligible. Approximately 25 to 30, is that total or per? per? Total. Okay, so, and then the with the non-public students, that's not per school, that's total 120 to 130. Correct. All the schools I listed in the presentation, that include every all the students that were together. Together, it's just 130. Okay. Yep. Thank so you. out of the 15 schools, there's 130 kids. That just goes to show that we have buses that sometimes we have four or five kids. Sometimes we have one or two kids that are going on a 25-minute ride with two students on the bus. It's a shaper. And again, it looks like, yeah, it's less than 5% of the total private school population that would be impacted. So it's not a significant number, even though it could have a significant impact on our ability to serve all the clients, correct? Correct. Yeah, I would suggest that as you send out the information in a mail, let those kids particularly have those in their book bag. That way parents are aware ahead of time. And I appreciate that you're gonna make this plan ahead of time. We can do that, but we're required by law to mail it to their home as well. Beside, okay. In addition. In addition, yes. So, Chris, my question is, out of the 100, approximately 160 people that would get this letter, do you feel like most of them aren't using the service anyway? or? Yeah, like I said, some of the routes, we have um, 17 signed up for the route, and on a daily basis, we transport two. Some days we go down there, there's no one to transport. So... A lot of parents sign up initially. Some of them decide to take them on their own. Some of them use it as a backup. So um, more times than not, if they sign up for it, they, they use it less, less than half the people sign up, use it. So in every, on all the schools listed on there, there are no more than 20 kids signed up for any one of those schools. Any further questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Passage. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Board will move to new business on the agenda. Mrs. Bodie, you had a statement? Yes, first of all, I would like to recognize um, Cherokee Elementary. Um, they received the Purple Star Award. Um, and I believe there are three other, two, two other, two other and Lakota East, two other um, schools. And so the Ohio Department of Education is proud to announce that 263 Ohio schools received Purple Star designations as members of the Purple Star Class of 2022. Purple Star schools show a significant commitment to serving students and families connected to our nation's armed forces. 94 Ohio schools received the esteemed award for the first time and 169 schools earned a renewal after three years of dedicated Purple Star. So um, as a family of someone who is in our um, armed forces, I say thank you and I really appreciate um, your work and support for families. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bodie. And then I had another, I did have a statement. So I would like to publicly thank those parents and community members who have asked me to stand firm through what they see as a political attacks and to remember that a desire for accountability and transparency is a cardinal sin to most in power and certainly to the status quo. I will not resign and will continue to get to the bottom of the issues that were behind my election. Critical race theory is alive and well in programs and teachings in Lakota. I will be opposed, proposing meaning, meaningful community conversations to define and demystify the philosophy, expose its tenets and associated programs. Programs and teachings that are designed to ensure that critical race theory permeates every aspect of a child's education. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to action items. Madam President, may I ask one other question under new business? Certainly. Um, I had read in a parent newsletter about a new pilot project, I believe, called the Mesh Lab that's going to be taking place. It looks like 75 students in the 10th grade. There'll be a combined class with biology, um, 
geometry and English. And so maybe if we could at a future meeting, talk about that a little, yeah. I'd appreciate that because it sounds like a great opportunity for our students to try something a little different. Yeah, it's one of those unique programs like we had talked about earlier, but some of our other classes. So I'm glad to bring that up next month. That would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Any other new business? We'll move to board action items. I don't believe we have anything this evening. Is that right, Mrs. Slogan? Not that has been made aware to me, so no. All right, thank you. Treasurer's recommendations. I'll look for a motion to approve A, the minutes from April 25th and April 27th, 2022. B, approve the monthly finance reports for the month ending. And C, approve the open enrollment count for 2022-23 school year. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Schaefer. Do second. I have a second? Mrs. Casper? Is there any discussion? Yes. Um, I, I did not get these questions to you prior, Jenny, so I apologize. Right. Um, I do have a couple questions on um, the permanent improvement plan, and we're at $236,000 month to date. And so I just would like to see what that entails. Um, and then our food service for the month is 1,860,480. Again, I would just like a breakdown of what that entails. So are you asking to see this, the expenditures? The Folks, monthly expenditures for those two funds. So are you asking to see, so there's some detailed reports that I could give you that shows, here's the monthly expenditures, which would be each line. I, we can talk after this That's to fine. just kind of talk about mm -hmm what would suffice to satisfy that? I have, so, and then Wyandotte, um, their support for the month to date is extremely, um, su su I don't know what support for Wyandotte really in incorporates, but I would like to understand why it's $11,000 versus all of the other schools are significantly under that price. So those funds that are titled support, are um, what we term as, well, there are principles. So each building has three different um, budgets, if you will. They're gonna get a per, per pupil allocation out of the general fund. Then there's going to be an 018 fund, which is, a, we term it as a principles fund. Um, and then there is a, an 009 fund, which tracks their consumable expenditures for each building. So that 018 fund is gonna be really specific to that building and what those goals are. And a lot of them, they work hand in hand with their PTOs on um, coming up with goals. For example, I know there was a few years ago, there were improvements that they wanted to make to a playground. And so there were fundraising efforts that were in coordination with the PTO and the building principal um, to do those kind of things. And then your 009 fund is going to track those consumable expenditures. And the majority of that is through um, the class supply kits. And we did this back during the pandemic. Um, we created these supply kits um, that each building, so the grade bands work together to come up with, you know, what should be in that supply um, kit. Um, and then Chris Bassarge and his team goes out and because we are such a large district, we're able to get quotes on those supplies um, and actually, you know, use the size of the district for, um, you know, get better pricing and this year, um, there's been some supply chain issues as well as costs going up everywhere. But when you look at those particular um, buildings, it's going to be very unique to each building. So one month you might see some expenditures that are more than another, but drilling down into it, I mean, we can take a look into it but but it does not signify that the district is giving more support 
to one building versus another. Um, so hopefully that helps answer some questions. Okay, thank you, yes. As I'm, as I'm looking at the current balance, it aligns a little bit better. Um, I was just wondering why there was that higher expenditure and I didn't know if maybe you had some insight on, on what that was for Wyandotte, but um, we can dig into that later. The other um, thing I wanted to mention, the class of 2023, so that would be our junior, our junior um, class, they have an expense of 31,000 and 49,000. Can you explain what that, was that like a field trip or? Not without looking at it. Okay. I would have to take a look at it. Um, and there, we've also had the prom this month. Yes. So there could be some Probably expenditures prom. that are related to the prom, the after prom, graduation. Um, that would be my guess without taking a look at all of those details. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Mrs. Logan would be happy to meet with you to walk through those details mm -hmm. prior to the meeting as well. Mrs. Schaefer. I have a question, Jenny, if you could just review the open enrollment cap and how that impacts our families as well yes. as why people want to tell us if they move out of district. Yes. <laughs> so, I, you know, we've, we've talked about there are changes within the way that we fund um, our schools now. And, and Mr. Basarge talked about that with uh, transportation. There were rules that were changed around open enrollment as well. And so our funding is based on students that you are educating. So the way that this used to work with the open enrollment was every kid was $6,500 and the kids that came to us um, we got an additional $6,500 and the students that left us and went to another school district, $6,500 was deducted from us. Now it's changing somewhat and it's a little bit more complicated, um, but it still matters how many students that we educate. So those open enrollment students are included in our enrollment numbers, which we are funded for. We do, we have had a cap of 225 kids for years now, and we have not increased that. We do allow student, and it does look more because if a student moves throughout the year, we will allow them to stay in our district and let, and they complete the open enrollment um, paperwork and they get to stay with us. So those numbers will look more than 225, but it's because we do that. And it has averaged around 70 kids a year that move throughout the year and they get to stay with us. But when we started this and we only had that money leaving us and no additional money coming in, it was about $1.4 million that was deducted from us and we were not offsetting that. So this is really about if a, a child leaves us to go to another district, we're just filling that seat with an open, open enrollment student. So 225 would remain the cap um, and we have a priority list and the way that that priority list works first is Children of school district employees are first priority, then returning open enrollment students, siblings of returning open enrolled students, and new applicants. We have not taken any new applicants in years because we were meeting those numbers just by those top three. So hopefully that answers some of those questions. Any further comments or questions, yes. Mr. D? Yes, um, from these numbers that you gave, um, do you know the reason why we're losing this number of kids to other school districts? Is it because the parents are moving out of the district or is the choice? So the, the number, the around 70 students that stay with us, those students, those families are actually moving, but okay. they would like their kids to stay with us. I can't answer the question on the kids who are, the students who are open enrolling in another district at the beginning. Gotcha. They, they could have a parent who works in that other school district, just like we have that happen here. But I'd say it's for many different, very personal reasons. Awesome, thank you. Anything else? Sorry, Mrs. Schaefer. 
We had also, I know there's been some questions that we've received about that Peterman employees don't count as our employees. Is there any opportunity to amend that? Because while technically they work for Peterman, if they're Lakota Peterman drivers, would there be any interest in adding that? I, I just remember we've gotten a couple emails on this and I apologize, I did not bring it up prior to the meeting, but I'm just thinking that as we're approving so, that. I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you want to Could we it? amend the employee definition to also include our Peterman bus drivers as employees in the hierarchy of open enrollment status? I see. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but that could potentially bring in additional drivers. So, and again, so I should have brought this up ahead of time. So I apologize that I did not do that. I think so. it's worth us taking a look at. But yeah. Keep thinking. Good. All right. Anything further? All right, Mrs. Logan, anything further in your recommendations? Mm -hmm. We have treasurer recommendations. Approve the minutes for the 25th and the 27th. Approve monthly financial reports for the month ending and approve open enrollment cap for 2022-23. I have a motion and a second. Without further discussion, would you call the roll? Mrs. Schaefer? Yes. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mr. Adi? Yes. Mrs. Bodie? Yes. And Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. Thank you. I have superintendent recommendation action items, approved personnel items, approved field trips, and approved donations. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Mrs. Bodie? And Mr. Adi? Thank you. Is there discussion? Yes. I would like to bring up Mr. Uh, Jesse's concern. Regarding, so we don't discuss that in open session. Right. Can we pull that approval out so we can have more discussion as a board? May I clarify? Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Passage was approved already for a three year contract at the April 14th Board of Education meeting. However, his past contract, and I believe the contract before that was for five years. So this is in my term and in, in my terms, a cleanup item. So he's already been approved for a three, but he really should be a five like he has in the past. Also, um, administrative contracts are set annually in consultation with the board. So that's why it's listed the way it is and all the other ones were listed the same way back in April. So board, is there interest in pulling that item out? Is there a motion to do so? I would like to make, I would make a motion to pull out so we can have further discussion. Is there a second to the motion? Seeing no second, the motion dies. I have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any further discussion on the superintendent action items? Anything further, Mr. Miller? No, ma'am. All right. Mrs. Olgan. Mrs. Bodie? No. Mr. Eddy? Yes. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. Schaefer? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. Thank you. We've moved to our second portion for public comment. This can be on any item. And again, a reminder, speakers um, are encouraged to please state your name. When you see the yellow timer start, you know that you need to wrap up your comments and please be completed by the time the timer stops. Please direct all of your comments to the board chair and not to any individual board member. Please be respectful during our public comment. Let's not talk about any individual specific employee either, please. Um, I would ask also that audience participation is limited only to the person that's speaking. So no clapping, cheering, any other audience participation, please. We have several people on the agenda. We have 23 people, we have 30 minutes. So I'm going to ask you as I call your name and have at least three lined up at the same time. Let's move as quickly as we can in order to get through as many people as we can. Madam President, can I make a motion to extend the 30 minute period so everyone can speak? Is there a second to the motion? The motion dies. Mrs. Nix will be up first, Mrs. Emily Jackson will be second, Mrs. Heather Cameron will be third, Mrs. Souls Peters will be fourth, and Kate Bredis 
Britta Stegge will be fifth. Hi, my name is Linda Nix. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak. A lot of you guys have already known me. I've spoke before. It's been a while, but I've been following you on Zoom. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. Um, Liberty Town Township uh, resident. I am a newly retired nurse, 32 years. Met my husband taking care of his mama. <laughs> and um, we've been in Liberty Township over 25 years. I am a proud parent of a kindergarten to Lakota West graduate. And um, I am a eight year plus veteran of the Army National Guard and Army Reserves. Um, I've been very active all throughout the school, um, homeroom mom, classroom parties, all that good stuff. Uh, even the high school, it slowed down because they don't need us as much, but active through the theater and being a theater mom was the best part of, uh, you know, my job as being a parent in high school or one of them. So speaking to you is not a role that I enjoy. It's not my comfort zone. I am here because um, sometimes you have to speak up because things matter. And that's why I'm here. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Jenny. You are a freaking rock star, and we really appreciate you and the work you have done. And um, Mr. Miller, I can't tell you how much I appreciate everything you've done for this district and uh, the board. I thank you for hiring both of them because they are uh, just rock stars. Um, so uh, let's see here. I recently attended a mama bear retreat, um, and that's just for parents of LGBTQ kids. And when I was there, one of the speakers, it really impressed me. He did a slideshow, and one of the slides, um, it talked about absolute truth. And if you look at this, this is a cylinder. It's a piece of wood, but it's a cylinder. Absolute truth. If you look at it from this angle, you're going to see a circle. If you look at it from this angle, you're going to see a rectangle with the shadow. That's an absolute truth. So I see a lot of problems with our school board, seeing absolute truths, and there is no coming together from the shadows. You're seeing a circle, you're seeing a square, and we need to start working together better. Um, you know, I, absolute truth, I have three birds in my house. Absolute truth, I detest them. <laughs> They're not going away for a few years, but we work around things to make things happen. So I expect you as a board to do the same. You can't let certain things determine what's best for our kids, what's best for the district. And so I encourage all of you, I thank you for being proactive on dealing with a lot of hard things that you've had to deal with. And I thank you for doing the job that you're doing. Keep at it. Thank you, Mrs. Nix. Mrs. Jackson and Kara Rayford is next up after those have already named. Please go ahead. So, thank you, board. I'm going to try to keep it quick for my respect for the other parents and teachers. Um, we accomplished a lot this year. The Purple Star Award, all of the donating to um, hurricane tornado victims, Hopewell Jr. mentored younger Hopewell Tigers, we had a flag retirement ceremony. Those are all examples of social and emotional learning in action. We don't have to be that person in order to show empathy and respect for what other students are going through. Our athletic department, and most of these are at West because I'm West Pipeline, won district bowling. We went to state for swimming, wrestling. We achieved a golf state championship. We celebrated city champions for gymnastics, a GMC football title, our academic quiz team made school history with the most wins in a season. We are closing the year with 44 collegiate signings at West, well worth $2,400. Supporting these accomplishments are our teachers and coaches. Among them, we celebrated three education excellence awards, Two coaches attained 500 career wins and a counselor won the Hope, Strength, and Healing Award for supporting grieving students. Our success is the result of the student and teacher relationship. We have the best teachers because we provide a safe environment for them. I am concerned that recent events by board members will impact our teacher staffing levels. Policies are in place to foster learning, collaboration, and show confidence in our teachers. Teachers who can retire now might leave if we continue to allow distractions in their classrooms. Autonomy retains our experienced teachers and proven educators. 
We will not stay a desirable district if new teachers fear hypercritical interactions with board members. A small neighboring district had over 200 applicants for their elementary teaching posting. Will we see that kind of turnout with our applicants if we are on the news locally and nationally with current distractions? Therefore, I ask the board president to make a motion at a future meeting to remove Mrs. Bodie from her subcommittee meetings to show support for teachers. Our meetings will then be effective by reducing from her distractions, repeated resolutions, baseless accusations prevent us from getting real work done. Teachers are tired, parents are tired, you're probably tired. Let's take the step to begin healing our district and show teachers what we see, we value them, we support them, and we want them to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Mrs. Cameron is up next. Mr. Greer, join the line, please. Hello, I'm Heather Cameron. I live at Silver Skate Drive, Liberty Township. Thank you for allowing myself and the community to be here and for giving us the opportunity to speak. I rolled into this last weekend at the beloved Indie Fest Carnival at Independence Elementary School. My kids enjoyed hanging out with their friends while playing games, eating snow cones, and seeing their classmates. This morning, I pulled into the parent drop-off line at Independence Elementary. As I pulled in, I heard the sounds of brass instruments playing over by the buses. Students surrounded the band members as they played music and celebrated the ending of a great year, the retirement of a great principal, and the welcoming of a new season. The compassionate and student-centered decisions that are made by our district leaders are what motivate me to continue showing up to these board meetings and staying invested in what is happening in regards to Ohio House bills. I walked up the stairs to this room and I saw E plus R equals O posters on the wall. Event plus reaction equals outcome. This acronym is something that my kids actually educated me about after they learned about it in school. This simple equation has given me something to reflect upon when feeling stressed, frustrated, or overwhelmed. My son's teachers have been incredibly helpful with the simple verbiage and routine changes that have been immensely helpful with executive functioning skills. The school counselor, Tony, has also helped me guide, guide me down this path, and I am forever grateful for the effective tips that I have learned because of these individuals, employees in this excellent district. To say that these tips and techniques have been life-changing is a significant understatement. I am grateful for our district's social emotional learning implementation to the curriculum, helping students learn self-management, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness are all integral skills that are necessary in order to become successful, happy adults. These social emotional skills are necessary to exceed in life, in relationships, and in parenting. Um. In the field that I work in, those of us who hold credentials are expected to successfully and consistently demonstrate seven professional core values. The seven professional core values include accountability, altruism, compassion and caring, excellence, integrity, professional duty, and social responsibility. I appreciate that the district is helping to create well-rounded community members who understand the necessary emotional and interpersonal skills needed to be successful in their future careers. I know what we have and I know what we could lose if partisan politics are allowed to play a role on this school board. I want to thank Mr. Miller for his quick action this week in regards to the safety of our students and building security. Mrs. Cameron, could you please complete your comment? Jenny Logan, you are a rock star and we will miss your smile, your patience and your knowledge. Thank you. Mr. Hall, you're next in the line. <coughs> Dresden Souls Peters, Anderson Drive, Liberty Township. Could you pull the mic just a little bit closer? Yep. Thank you. Hello, as always, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak. 
These are trying times for Lakota. We are making international moves, not for our outstanding academia, but for extremist elements. I am here today to thank the teachers, staff, and principals of Lakota East High School and Liberty Early Childhood School, as well as Matt Miller for acting in the best interests of the students at all times. Please know that your recent efforts are recognized and appreciated by the parents of the students in your schools. As a parent of a child with anxiety, autism, ADHD, and social pragmatic communication disorder, the recent actions by a by the school, by a member of the school board are deeply concerning. Social emotional learning is of vital importance to helping our students learn to regulate themselves, particularly after the last two years of a high stress and rapidly changing conditions. And some of these techniques would be a great value to some members of the board. To hear that there are extremists who are attacking these well-researched and effective practices based on political rhetoric without an understanding of what SEL actually is, is repugnant. Please keep SEL in our schools. Our students need it. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's Melanie Phillips, but I'm not totally positive. And Liberty Township, you're next up, please. Go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, firstly, congrats to all of the student award winners. They are all truly amazing. And so many of us are in awe of their achievements. Genuinely, these, these kids are fantastic. And I love coming here and hearing about all of this as I'm sure so many of us do. Um, next, I would like to add to um, the chorus of voices from the last week to all of our teachers from Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you so much to our educators, our teachers, our staff, uh, the intervention specialists, occupational therapists, uh, speech therapists, nurses, teaching aides. Um, you have all endured quite the load for the last few years, and we sincerely appreciate you and what you do. And I personally cannot thank you enough with uh, the support you give my children who are in need of the special need IEP services. Uh, thank you to Mr. Miller and to Jenny Logan for being the supportive entities that you are and all of your hard work and quick actions for all of our staff, students, and educators. Uh, our diversity is what makes Lakota great, what makes all of our students feel that they have a home here, that they're welcome, that they are accepted for who they are. Uh, thank you to the board members, administration, and staff and educators who acknowledge and support these kids. You make them feel welcome and accepted for who they are. I would once again request that our school board make a public statement in opposition to House Bill 616, the so-called Don't Say Gay Bill. Uh, this bill will severely harm our students, their families, members of the community. These are our families who live in Butler County, in Lakota, who came here for our schools, our family, our communities. Please show them that you value them. Please show them that you are standing up for them, for all students. Every single student matters or none of them do. Please open your hearts and acknowledge that they are every much as worthy and valuable as any other student in Lakota, the queer kids, the neurodiverse kids, the kids who don't always fit the mold, who may need some extra love, some extra help. They are every bit as worthy as the straight A 4.0 GPA valedictorian star athletes, leading musicians. All of them are worth it. Uh, and next, I would ask, please, if we could in the future look into a policy to implement background checks for every elected official that we have. There is genuinely no reason not to. Uh, any job anywhere would require a background check. I don't see why this one should be any different. There is currently not a board policy in place to my understanding, unless I am mistaken. So I'm asking to please implement one. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Redestegi. Mrs. Jo Jonason, please join the line. Madam Chairperson, uh, board, Ms. Logan, Mr. Miller, I just want to thank the board um, for all, all the wonderful opportunities you give our students. I mean, the, the students that you, uh, you recognized this evening were, were wonderful examples of what this school district gives to our students. And my, my son happens to be one of those students, and I really appreciate it. I also want to thank the, the board for its collective leadership in dealing with the recent difficulties that the school board has faced. Um, 
And Ms. Logan, I would like to thank you for your work as treasurer. And you will be missed. Your expertise and crunching numbers will be missed. I don't understand them, but I appreciate it. Um, and Mr. Miller, uh, thank you so much for being our superintendent. Um, seems like your job is like herding cats. Uh, every day you, you, you're facing challenges because of the fluid environment within the school board. I never realized that until I started coming to these school board meetings. So thank you very much. You're much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Jessica Allmeyer, please join the line. Is Kara Rayford still here? Okay, go ahead, Mr. Hall. Todd Hall, I'll defer my three minutes for the next person. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, we can give him a round of applause. That was kind yeah. of <laughs> That's quick. That was even shorter. That was amazing. Yep. Uh, Murphy Goodman, please join the line. Helene, is it Phillips? Um, I'm Jill Jonathan. Am I next? Okay. Is Melanie not here? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. I guess I'll go next. Um, so I'm. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, from an op-ed that I wrote about protecting public education and teachers um, that was published in the Enquirer recently. I mentioned three state bills that are related to education. And the reason that these are relevant to the board is because you are the governing body of 17,000 students. So I think you need to know what's happening at the state level and the community deserves to know your stance on these bills. So just a little preface. Pref preface. <laughs> So this is from the op-ed I wrote. House Bill 616 is the latest bill that will harm public education in Ohio by censoring what's being taught. This bill combines don't say gay with teaching restrictions on race. Make no mistake, this bill will silence teachers. It calls for the creation of a complaint process so anyone could charge a teacher or administrator with violating the rules set forth in the bill. Teachers could have their teaching licenses revoked and schools could lose state funding if they are found to have violated those rules. It seems that the goal is to create such uncertainty about rules and potential lawsuits that it scares teachers and administrators away from the subjects. This is part of an old playbook dating back to the tactics used to undermine the teaching of evolution in public schools. Teachers simply avoided the subject to make their lives easier. I'm afraid this is what is going to happen with bills like HB 616, HB 322, and HB 327. HB 322 and HB 327 were introduced last year, and I argued in another op-ed called America, We Need to Face Our History, All of It, that those bills would prohibit an accurate teaching of American history and restrict school districts' ability to work toward becoming more equitable and inclusive places for our children. So if you care about the future of education, it's time to start paying attention to what's going on at the state level and speak up. We need to protect public education and our teachers and administrators. We can't leave them to fight these battles for us. We need to show up and support them. So that's what I feel like I'm doing now. And that's why I think it's important for you to give us your stance on these bills. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Jonason. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, join the line, please, and Dania. Antwish also joined the line. Hi, Jessica Allmeyer, Lakota alumni and current Lakota parent. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. I have to, of course, begin by uh, recognizing the amazing students that were honored today. Their artwork and accomplishments are, wow, so impressive. They were so well-spoken and such an excellent rep representation of Lakota as a district. Now, I would like to thank the majority of the board that took swift action to protect the integrity and safety of our district last week. I believe the vast majority of the code families, regardless of their personal politics, want their children's education to be the priority, not want to see Lakota in the center ring and negative press, sorry. All of this manufactured fear and drama is a distraction. I hope that this disrespect will come to a stop. We do not need a crusader to expose our schools when the evidence consistently points to the fact that Lakota is a great school district. As a reminder, just two years ago, parents had full and real-time access at home to all lessons, assignments, and curriculum for two months when all of our students went virtual. And you might remember that following that period, the overwhelming majority of families wanted their students back in person with the teachers in the school. And of those choosing to remain virtual, it was often because of concerns for the spread of COVID or in the other cases, not wanting their children to wear a mask, not because there were concerns about what was being taught. 
That alone shows that we do not doubt the education our children are getting. On that note, I would also like to praise the teachers and administrators across the district and thank them for their dedication to our children. Last week was Teacher Appreciation Week, and while some attempted to overshadow that, I hope our teachers know that we value and we try. We appreciate their hard work. We recognize how challenging the job is, and we support them. With that in mind, I would like to ask the board what measures are being taken to secure our staffing for the years to come. Recent studies have shown up to 55% of teachers have a desire to leave the profession, and 90% say that burnout is a problem. And while the desire to leave does not always play out completely, we must take teacher satisfaction and retention seriously. Teachers are people, not robots, and we need more than just a body in the room babysitting our children. We need people that love their jobs, that are passionate about what they do, and are good at it. And everyone works better when they're happy. Teachers need support. They need time for lesson planning and collaboration. They need work-life balance. And most importantly, they need the respect from students, parents, the community, administrators, and board members. What are we doing to ensure that that happens? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ormeyer. Mr. Gray, please join the line. Mr. Kruger, please join the line. Doing a tune-up here. All right. <laughs> Good evening, Murphy Goodman. Uh, recently moved here about eight months ago. I'm very excited about getting my kids into the school district. Uh, I'm very proud of all the achievements that the young people achieved and got to learn about a little bit tonight. And so that's kind of why I have mixed emotions kind of coming up here before the board because. Uh, Earlier, before I heard all the good news that the students were doing, I was mostly just embarrassed um, by what's been going on the last couple of weeks. So um, can we please put together a timeline for when the board can publish the list of examples of where CRT is being directly and indirectly taught in the schools? Um, specifically, is it being tested? Are children doing book reports on the legal text that underpins the theory? And then what are the tactics that are being employed uh, by the teachers? I'd like to understand that. And then most importantly, can we provide, um, a, provi provide a sanitized uh, list of accounts of children that have been harmed by these so-called CRT teachings that they are being exposed to? Because I am concerned about hearing about that. And then um, the board has created an environment where parents are very scared for different reasons. And those fears are confoundingly rooted in hyperbolic and specifically vague rhetoric. Please stand up and don't allow someone to get away with violating safety policy to get answers while not providing any compelling evidence of anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Please don't, please don't. No audience participation. Thank you, folks. Mr. Hoffman is up. Mrs. Dawsonbach. Or Dawson Beck is up after that, is joining the line. Go ahead. Rich Hoffman, 494 Rockdale Road. Uh, the circus everybody's talking about uh, was, uh, it's a series of things. There's a pattern of behavior that we've observed over the last few years. And I would say it started with Todd Parnell. Uh, that was my representative. And we had some controversy here. And he handled it not so good. He made some mistakes. And... Uh, I didn't see a lot of support for him. I understand there's people on the board that don't represent me at all. There's people who do. Uh, and I think we all have to agree to hash it out. That's the purpose of the board meeting. But you don't actively work to get rid of people. And I saw that with Todd Parnell. Now, a year ago, this uh, board got in trouble for an improper meeting. There was a lawsuit. It cost thousands of dollars. It was a mistake. I don't think anybody on the board met to make the mistake. It's coming out of some COVID rules. It was a tough time, uh, but uh, it was against the law. And the, uh, the papers wrote about it, uh, that the board broke the law. And it was, uh, it was embarrassing. It made everything look real bad. And then now we've had uh, an election. Um, when Todd Parnell was removed, there was a replacement. That replacement was rejected by the voters. And uh, we had two candidates that came on. Each, each gained 8,000 votes, more than you normally see in a typical school board type of election. So there's a lot of support out there. I don't think they're here tonight. Um, but, and, but, the, but the case, hey, uh, there's, this is a small room. There's a lot of voters out there. 
And, and to the laugh, I did, I do appreciate that I did receive a nice little uh, brochure. I've seen some shirts here that say it, um, but I was sent this one really nice little offer if I wanted to buy one of these shirts. It's the, we are Lakota, it says the same thing it says back there, but it's in rainbow colors. And I don't think this is my little pony rainbow colors. I think this implies sexual type lifestyle alternatives. That's what it is, folks. So, and, and on here it says, "He, him, she, her, they, them, we." Now, it's okay to be inclusive, but don't jam it down our throats. And if this is in high school, that's one thing. But if it's around two, uh, second, third grade kids, that's a problem. And I think I have a representative. I have a couple of representatives that are on the school board now, but the uh, one in particular that's been asking these questions are questions I've wanted to see asked. And I emphatically support her, and I would vote for her again tomorrow. Uh, and again, if she wants to run, I can't imagine why she would want to, but I would again if she did. And I think uh, all her 8,000 voters would do so as well. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Folks, please do not. Thank you. Uh, Shinden. Okay, Shinden Laiju, we are running out of time. So we'll keep moving as quickly as we can and get as many people as we can in. Uh, Dania? Yeah, Dania. Okay. If I sound shaky and nervous, that's because I am, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Hold on. Okay. Hi, my name is Dania Hontouche. I am a current senior at Lakota East High School. I have been a part of this district since kindergarten and I will have the privilege of graduating next Friday. Um, I'm here to say some clear and honest words that I've been keeping to myself these past few months. It is evident to say that the climate among our district has grown to be tense as people start to question the system of our education comes a wave of claims that CRT is quote, quote, all over the district. I know that politics have become prevalent and no matter where we go, we struggle to escape its presence. But I'm here to say that as this district moves forward, I ask that the board and community stops distracting them themselves from issues that simply do not exist. It not only reflects our district negatively, but is unfortunately pretty comical. As a student who has been in this district for many years, to answer that one guy's question, I have not felt any hint of indoctrination and many other students can stand to say this too. Teaching the explicit parts of America, America's history is not critical race theory. Saying that racism existed and continues to exist is not critical race theory. Teaching black history is not critical race theory. A sticker on a teacher's door that says safe space is not critical race theory. It's an act of basic human respect because God forbid we respect other people. I understand that we all have different views and I respect the ability for all of us to think differently. But when it comes to defaming the teachers who make the teachers at the school a better place, and attempting to sugarcoat history, I don't find it tolerable. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gray. Thank you, my name. My name is Leo Gray, 5665 Liberty Pass Drive. Uh, I want to thank everybody here for staying in their seats and listening to everything that's been going on. But Lakota's diversity and inclusion mission states, and I quote, Lakota local schools will actively recruit faculty and staff that reflects the diversity of our community and engage in courageous conversations and training about the diversity in all of its forms, cultural, racial, social economics, sexual orientation, gender identification, and religion in order to establish a welcome, productive environment for all. Why do they teach their ideas on these parent responsibilities? Lakota should be teaching math, English, history, and I mean all history, which by the way has declined in the past few years. Elgin Card says that teachers do not have the discretion on what they teach. They have discretion to design lesson plans. That sounds like the same to me. Keith Koenig states that Lakota does not use hard copy textbooks, but rely on digital 
textbooks. They rely on federal, state, local, and teacher input. I was told by Koenig, director of curriculum, on what they teach. They have discretion and that he would send me these digital links. This was never done. Card says he's not familiar with the word woke. Woke is a word that means wake up to racially, to racial and sexuality. This is part of Lakota's diversity program. The NEA and OEA have accepted the critical race theory. Lakota belongs to these organizations. They are creating hate and racial division among our children. Remember, all men are created equal and have equal opportunity. We don't have to have different rules for all the nationalities and all the religions and all the sexual arrangements and so forth. We have a law that creates, teaches everybody to be equal. Some people should not get ex, uh, preference and opportunities. The election stated very strongly that parents feel that it is their responsibility to have no sex and race with their children and replace two of Lakota school board. Do what parents Mr. want. Mr. Gray, I have to ask you to wrap up your comments, please. Okay. My basic thing is Elgin Card and his staff should resign and the department dismantled. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, Mr. Kruger, I'm sorry, we have run out of time for our public comment. And I apologize that we're going to have to stop there. However, I would be happy to stay after and listen to, and I'm sure my fellow board members would, to speak to any of the people still remaining on our list. Um, I apologize. Would you sir. at least give me the opportunity to distribute what the essence of yes, my uh, yes, that's fine. Is going to be? Madam President, I would like to make a motion for the rest of the community members to speak. Is there a second to that motion? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kruger. My original motion was to extend the time. My current motion is to allow the. I second for Ms. Darby. I second for Ms. Darby. Let's, let's have those on the line already to speak, please. So that would be Mr. Kruger, Mrs. Dessenbach. There's a motion 